Good evening. We have a quorum. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. Yeah. First up for general information, Mr. Dwyer. Um, so I'm going to first ask if anyone uh, other than Carol and Brennan and Mike Mason are here for the COVID testing site at Hampshire Mall. Evidently not. Uh, is that? Uh, it's Tommy. Tommy's on. Okay, but I'm not seeing anyone from the company. Yeah, yeah, Awesome's on. Oh. Um, is he in the plane? Okay. I, think I don't know about you, but if people have the capability to show their pictures and, you know, they're presentable, it would really be great to see the hell who's talking to us. Thank you. He wants you to. No, I'm not. I'm not talking. So Awesome seems to be having a difficulty unmuting. So let me see if there's anything I can do on this end. I don't think anyone else is having difficulty unmuting. So, um, awesome. Maybe you have to leave and come back. Or use a different device, maybe. So, um, while we're waiting to see that play out, um, uh, Randy was was in next. Oh, I'm sorry, awesome back here. Let me try. Let's try this one more time. So I'd like to, uh, and uh, I'd like to try to get take care of this so that we can let the uh, chief and the town administrator go. I don't know why my name's on earlier than the meeting. So awesome, uh, are well, you? Can you hear me? I just want to listen in. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, we, we hear you. Can you? Uh, you want to mute? Sorry about that. It wasn't letting me unmute myself. How are you guys doing today? My name is Asim Arshad. I'm with Testing One Two Three, looking to open up a COVID test uh, drive-through in the Hampshire Mall. I can't see. So I was looking to get the approvals in order to start up. Um, I was told by Carolyn that um, this location would be great due to the problems with the first location I was trying to open up. Um, there was problems with the traffic and issues with not having enough space to do the COVID testing. So now I have talked to Lynn Gray, who is in coordination with the Hadley, uh, with the Hampshire Mall location. And she gave me the green light to go ahead and start the process of getting the city approval so I can get in there and uh, get some COVID testing done. Do you have a plan we can look at to see what you want to do? I, I do have a plan. Um, I was unsure if you would like me to send it to the uh, general email. I will enable you to share your screen. Um, one second. I will do that right now. Okay, let me just... Okay, you're good to share. If you wish to email it to 
um, I can I can share it from my end. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, you can go ahead with the email. Uh, I can send it through right now. Um, can I get the email, please? I don't have it yet. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Awesome. Do you do you need the planning board email? Is that what you were? Yes, asking? that's what that's what I was waiting for. It's, I do need the email. In order. It's planning. It's planning at hadleyma.org. Got it. Planning. Planning at hadleyma.org. Okay, got it. Let's see get through right now. I should, it should have gone through now. I'm also going to send a, a, a layout of the actual lot and highlighted highlighting showing where the vehicles would be routed through. Okay, I have that. Mr. Dwyer, um, Chief Banking Able is trying to get on. He said someone needs to let him on if you had a chance. Okay. Well, we're not. Thank you. Nothing is happening at the moment. So I have a Word document, but I do not have a plan of any sort. Um, I It should be in a secondary email. I sent it in a separate email. Okay. I will resend it now. All right, well, let me let me put up what I have so far. And um, and if you want to start telling us what you're planning to do, I'll get the other one up as soon as I as soon as it comes through. Okay. Um, well, first things first, uh, this, the, what we're offering is going to be no cost to the clients that will be coming to the drive-thru. It'll be available to the people in the surrounding areas. Um, we're making sure, well, I also read an article recently, uh, the reason why we're making sure that they're going to be stringent 
testing and standards, making sure that there's going to be no issues with getting results. Uh, there was an article I read regarding another lab in the area of Worcester and New, New Hampshire. And I saw that um, that's actually one of the labs that we are not working with. And uh, just wanted to put that out there to begin with. So um, the, the only thing that the customers would be required would be to uh, fill in an application once they come to the drive through which would just ask for general information, like their name and address. And uh, if they were in contact with anybody that had COVID-19 and if they, have any, if they currently have any symptoms. Um, we changed our business model. Um, originally, we were going to do uh, just walk-ins. Um, I'd, I'd see I'd seen that that was a problem previously with the last location. So we set it up to have time slots for people to be able to drive up to the drive through in order to make sure that we don't have no problems with the traffic on the main street of Russell, which would be the entrance way to the plaza. Um, the site plan shows uh, the highlighted areas of where we were going to have the traffic flow through, starting at Russell Street and ending behind Target. Um, there are two reserved lanes for us behind Target, specifically for us to have queues and the whole left side of the parking lot itself. Uh, PPP would be, uh, would be uh, provided for the employees that we would hire to, for traffic flow and to get the information from the clients and the tests. Uh, the PPP would include uh, masks and the general PPP that is required, uh, like uh, the robes and the masks and the gloves and et cetera. Mm -hmm. What we would be, what would we, what would we be, what would, what we would be testing for is PCR and rapid tests. Uh, PCR, the results right now we're looking for, uh, we're, we're getting, generally getting it back in 24 to 48 hours, and uh, we're hoping to keep that consistent moving forward. Um, we're looking to open up at eight o'clock and close at five, uh, depending on how much, how many people are already in queue in the line. Um, we're estimated to be doing anywhere from 25 to 50 uh, vehicles in a day, depending on the traffic flow. If there are any questions or anything that I didn't cover, you can, uh, I can definitely yeah. answer those. 25 to 50 people a day in an eight, in a nine hour day. Where did you get the Where did you get the estimate of up to 50 people no, a day uh, from? Uh, no, just generally, because uh, um, in order to in order to not hinder the traffic, we would just uh, we would need to first be in the location, see how much traffic we would have, and accordingly, we would be able to adjust our our scheduling to have time slots for people. So at the starting, um, we're not going to be just opening up and having uh, like just walk-ins welcome because we don't want to, uh, we don't want there to, to be too much traffic. As uh, I saw online, was that that was at the other mall. So the reason for all of this is just I put estimated of 25 to 50 people because we don't know what the traffic flow will be, and, and accordingly we will adjust the scheduling and make sure that we have enough people and enough people for the time slots to make sure that there won't be any issues. I I understand that, but I'm I'm just thinking that you're 25 to 50 people per day is grossly underestimated. I would guess you may be looking to see, once they find out where you are and that you're there, you may be seeing 25 people an hour, let alone in a, in a, in a nine hour day. You're, I, I just believe you're gonna be inundated with people, even if you say you're only going to be by appointment. That's gonna be very difficult to manage. Yeah, so we plan on uh, starting with uh, two to three employees on site managing everything, but um, depending on what, what, would, what, what would be necessary for optimum efficiency, we would definitely hire more personnel if needed. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. The plan has arrived. There we go, sorry about that. Yeah, that was the plan. So uh, as you can see, the highlighted area starts on Russell Street. So they would enter here. Um, the whole left side would be designated specifically for me and have the whole uh, queue starting if you're if all the way to the starting if needed. Uh, but the back two lanes or back two lanes are reserved specifically for me. And uh, we would have queues going all the way down if necessary. How many cars can you queue in that, in that 
arrowed, red arrowed line about do you estimate? I, I personally uh, have not estimated it. Uh, I was thinking maybe around 50 to 40 cars uh, if they were lined up start uh, from all the way from the beginning to the end, maybe. Okay. I mean, the, the, the plan. I could, be, I could be, I could be underestimating it too. Uh, it's a very big plaza. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you could, you could probably queue at least 30 to 40 cars there. So that, that's, that's reasonable number. Okay. Um, the, I, I mean, it's a whole lot better. I mean, there's no way you could do this next to the uh, Auto Express. The I mean, they could barely fit six cars there, let alone um, too much of anybody. So this is a much better option. This is going to all be outdoors. You're going to have a tent or something? Oh, no, this will be outdoors. They're, the, the people, the clients will not be leaving their vehicles. That will be just a constantly flowing queue of vehicles moving through. And, and we will have, for personnel, for, for, for personnel, we will have a cover, but um, not, not necessarily a tent, but something removable. So, so the, the people are going to take their own swab samples? Uh, yes, it's a self-testing. Okay. It's, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a little spot, uh, spo it almost looks like a Q-tip with a little sponge on it. And uh, you could either get it from your throat or from your nose. And it's a, a little vial, you just break the Q-tip in there and you close yeah. it. Yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm familiar with the test, I've had it done, so that's fine. Okay, thank you. Other questions from anybody else? Uh, yeah, the, he's gonna need some signage and uh, does he have any indications of where the signs will be and uh, how many there will be? Um, we're going to definitely put up a sign on the main road in the grass area, like a, like maybe a two by three sign in the postage on, in the grass area to specify that this is the route for you to go. And I would definitely have to have signage in order for traffic flow to make sure that everybody knows which way to be going. Um, I will, I'm thinking maybe, Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, yeah, so I was thinking definitely going to put a couple signs on the main road and it's just some guidance signs going down the going down the driveway of where it would lead to the back. The deliveries to Target and some of the other stores, the tractor trailers follow, I believe, follow the route you have in Red Arrows. How is that going to be coordinated? Um, I will definitely ask Christopher, uh, sorry, Christian, the person that who, who I'm in contact with at the Hampshire Mall and see what specific times that they usually get the deliveries through. Um, and from there, I can coordinate um, with Christian and my, uh, myself and make sure that I'm not hindering any of their ability to come in, come in and out through the back to deliver their stuff. Because I believe that I'm not sure where the Target loading dock is. I think, Jimmy, right in the middle of Target uh, in the south end. I think it's over here. Okay. Oh, okay, there it is. There it is, yes. Oh, that's it. That's loading dock? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you want? What? So uh, will we classify these signs as directional? And, I mean, I'm assuming. Yes. Is, yeah, I'm assuming this is a temporary project. But, but, uh, yeah. I, it it is it is. Uh, I I'm going to sign a six month contract with room for extension, uh, depending on whether they would be giving me the ability to continue on over there. Uh, at the moment, I'm I'm going to be there for the, the next six months. But I have the ability to to extend with the Hampshire Mall. Okay. Hey, Jim. Jim, can I ask a couple of questions? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, just doing some quick math here, I, I I would agree with the estimate that you could probably queue about forty or maybe thirty to forty cars in that long line. And you know, for me personally, as far as public safety goes. I don't necessarily care if the mall is willing to allow, you know, him to block up that whole road. My problem is this. Um, 
with a nine hour business time and estimating, you know, 25 to 50 cars, the math suggests you're talking about five and a half cars per hour, um, which seems certainly manageable to the point where you would not need that long queue of cars. So my concern is, are we starting small uh, and going to expand? You don't need that entire queue of cars if you're talking about five cars an hour and a swab that takes max 30 seconds to do. Well, I under I actually undershot the numbers specifically for the reason being that uh, previously I had the business model of walk-ins uh, necessarily just being able to just pull up and get tested. But we're trying to change the business model to ensure that the traffic flow is going to be consistent. And uh, that is an undershoot of numbers. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm hoping to get more than that. Uh, I, I, the, really, the reason why I put those numbers in are because we don't know what necessarily how much traffic would be going through this location. I feel personally as if the, the super, super hectic wave of testing has died down since we are now almost 20 days past New Year's. So yeah, I, I would definitely going to be more people testing, but I feel like it won't be to the point where we're going to have to hinder anything, any traffic on the main road. Yeah, and that's great. I, I, I would agree with the fact that the testing, you know, is going to is going to drop dramatically. And I think if you're going to use a portion of the mall, this is the way to use it. That road, certainly that access road gets used less than the other ones. And that back parking lot is certainly less full than the other ones. My my issue, like I said, is, is as long as you can keep the vehicles in that parking lot and you don't hinder emergency vehicles getting to different parts of the mall, and it definitely cannot come out onto Route 9, um, as long as you have a plan for all that, then as far as the police department is concerned, I don't necessarily have any concerns. But like I said, the math was not adding up for me. Five cars an hour, you don't even need that road. You know, you can park them in the parking lot or, or just drive them in the back and drive them through. So some of this is, and, and the fact that you're signing a six-month lease, lease suggests that maybe there's some other plans for the future. And, you know, I've seen the, the mall, the other mall that they were using, um, and, you know, people were lining up the night before to get a test the next morning. And I just, I can't imagine that this mall and or Route 9 would be able to help, you know, hold that kind of capacity. That's my concern. It's got to stay in the parking lot, 100%. Mm -hmm. Understood. And I will do my best to make sure that I, I hire staff, mainly staff that's specifically there to control traffic. Um, uh, better to be safe to be sorry. Rather, it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, there could be another wave coming through, too. So, I mean, definitely we, the space would be necessary for me just to feel comfortable. So what's your, what's your model? What's your model for uh, people signing people to sign up for tests? Is it all web based or is it? Yes, uh, it's going to be the, it's going to be web based. All right, and you're not going to take walk-ins at all. You're going to advertise like that. We are not taking walk-ins. Don't just show up. Things like that. Yes, we're going to advertise that it's uh, walk-ins. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Um, just on the fire department side, I mean, if if sorry. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Um, Walk-ins, like like I said, necess necess this is all ne necessary. Um, this is necessarily just going to be ba based on how much traffic there is coming to the location. So um, if, if required, then, and if not needed, then we can definitely put back into the effect of the, of the walk-ins just while we're not known in the area, you know. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, my only concern is if there is any backflow on that target side, that's our fire department connection there. So there should be no vehicles parked there at any time. Um, that needs to be a clear access through that side. On, um, on the on the on the east side of target, that's where our fire department okay. connection is. That's so, so, so that that right there should just be a, a drive through as cars from from one into the other should not be stacked. Correct. That's why I was asking if this is set in stone because it, in my opinion. It would be better off of South Maple Street and wrap around the opposite direction because then you're not impacting our access because there's multiple other pathways to get to JC Penney. Um, but that target side, you know, it's uh, it is two lanes, but um, 
I just, I know I had, I drove through East Hampton this past week to go to a chief's meeting and one of these uh, test sites was opened up and the traffic was backed all the way back into the road uh, and into the rotary. So I, I know you're doing appointments and everything. And as long as we can guarantee that there's no parking, you know, nobody's queued in the area on that east side of target. That would be my only concern. Mike, is there room on the side of target <laughs> for two vehicles to pass each other? Like, let's say a fire truck and a car. It's, it's, it's tight. It's uh, and if we, if we need to address that um, connection, then there would not be. So uh, we would have to push vehicles out of there if they were parked. Um, yeah. And if there, if there, if, if there is an incident and you got to get by and the cars are not parked right up tight to the building, that's going to be extremely time consuming to move them. Yep. We also have a second. Uh, so there's multiple zones here. The back of the uh, between Cinemark and the food court area, there's also multiple um, fire department connections there to support those portions of the building as well. So our access way is normally coming in through this target side. Um, so again, if we could just make sure that that, you know, there aren't folks parked in that that area, if, you know, if it's just them oh, driving okay. through, then fine. I, I can possibly. Could you go ahead? Yeah, I would say I can possibly have personnel um, making sure that there aren't any people in queue in that specific area at any time. Where so where they would start Please earlier and stop right there specifically, and okay, possibly have to drive through only, not in park over there. Could you come in from the north, mate, from the south Maple Street entrance, the south, um, the southernmost entrance, and go around the back of the mall? Um, I feel like it would be. Uh, easier and more uh, tra worthy, I mean, because the traffic flow specifically would be on the left side, but um, I would definitely have to talk to uh, Christian and see if that would be something that he would be able to do, because this was pre-approved pre by Christian himself, too. From the I mean, I'm going to be very honest with you, and, and I don't mean to take offense with you, don't take this as an offense, but the convenience is irrelevant to the customer here. S building safety, and facility safety and fire truck safety is tantamount to anything else. And if it's impeding lots of emergency access around the, the, the east side of the mall, then this is not a good plan. And going around the entire back side of the parking lot where there's virtually not much of anything to impede is a much better plan. I can definitely speak to Chris, uh, Christian to see if he can approve uh, the, the use of the other side of the, of the mall. Um, the only thing, uh, would it work if I possibly had people to ensure ensuring that the queue stops right at the beginning of Target and then continues on after with nobody specifically parking in that area at any point of the day? I was going to suggest that that there's that kind of triangular island right by the target loading dock. If 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 you had staff out there that stopped people there, yes, exactly, yes, and didn't right. let them didn't let them go up the east side of target until it's cleared up there. That then I think work. then that also allows you know for fire trucks and other vehicles to get around the loading dock and get around you know it it frees up circulation because if that becomes one long queue, it's like a snake that you can't cross and you have to go all the way around. I, I do agree. Originally when you were talking, I was thinking about what I think Jim was just talking about, about coming off of North Maple across from Walmart. South Maple. Uh, south, south Maple and wrapping around the South side. But A, I do think, well, I like that because you'd be on the outside of, of the, instead of on the inside of the two lane. But when I thought about it, that is the most, most popular route, I think, is that south side. And so I think you'd be backing up regular commercial customers. And I think that that east side is less popular. And I also think if you did the south side, it does get a little pinched around the back of the theaters so yeah i i guess i i lean towards what you've got but having that triangular island being a kind of a stopping 
traffic check and then you get to scoot past target into the queue. I agree. I like that a lot. I will definitely put that into effect if we could use the left side of the lot. I would prefer That's to take a look at that south. If you could still ask about the south end, just because there's a lot of tractor trailer access there too to get to the target site. And then also there's trucks that are um, where you take that right turn, uh, the stop sign after target. There's tractor trailers that we're constantly trying to push out of there uh, that are delivering and they back into the area between Cinemark. That's just a really congested area there. So my concern is, is that we're going to be, you know, a lot of them are taking that outer ring there to make their turn so that they can back into the loading dock. Um, my personal opinion is that Southern access road is wide enough and it's away from everybody and everybody has numerous other pathways that they can take to access Planet Fitness and, and everything else. I think it's less of an impact to um, the facility in my opinion. Uh, but again, if, if you could just ask to see if that's an option, I would appreciate it. Okay, I definitely Wait, will. Yeah, to, 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 for, for, for testing traffic to be backed up all the way to the south Maple Street entrance, that's an awful lot of cars there. <laughs> yeah. Whereas yeah. putting four or five cars, even right where the testing site is proposed with the existing red arrows, you're going to be blocking where the fire truck access is for all kinds of fire truck hookups to the mall. Do you, do you have a plan C? <laughs> uh, this this was my plan C. Uh, the original location was uh, a self-standing location with a parking lot. Um, that originally did not work. So I was recommended by Carolyn to look into this mall due to the ability to have a, a lot more space and make sure that I don't impede any traffic. So this was the, the final plan. I've been working on the first plan for nearly a month. Uh, I was hoping that that one would go through. I found this one to be very beneficial for me. Uh, also for the ability to be able to use more area and have more clientele. So I said I, you're, you're trying to do this in a heavily traffic commercial area. What about, you know, where the vegan restaurant is, you got all that space there where uh, the Subaru place used to park their cars. I mean, that would be, there'd be no problem. Have you looked at that? Uh, no, I have not. The problem is this is a commercial, heavily trafficked commercial area, and you're trying to bring a business that is going to bring a lot of traffic here. We're not against it. It's just that it's problematic. Yeah. Uh, the people does it have to be on Route 9? Yeah, there's actually one of these already up and running in Holyoke, um, and I've seen that they got, got their process down now, and it's a lot better. So they're, it's, these are the same people that are, that are helping me at this location. So they already have one up and running in another mall down the road. Yeah, I do like the fact that you have a lot of asphalt off the, off the traveled roads and, and places to queue. But I also agree with Mike that, you know, that's fairly busy mall anyway. But um, I guess I would defer t to the chief's uh, fire and police so yeah i think uh the recommendation we have to kind of work on what's presented before us and we're not in here to design any except a little tweaking is necessary i would support this concept the way it is now with the uh mark yeah, that at the triangle the uh that area east of target will not be blocked for fire trucks and uh, see how it goes. I mean, if, if it really is a nightmare, then obviously uh, we have the zoning enforcement officer to uh, make other recommendations like slow down. Or shut it down. Okay. Or go to the south side. That's, that's, okay. That would be uh, an option if, if this, this did not work. Mr. Dwyer, you have comments? I, I am thinking that uh, historically this is a slower time, so it's probably a good time to be giving this a try. The, okay. um, the holiday rush has passed, uh, so there's not going to be as, as much of a crowd in there for now. Uh, 
I'm willing to give it a, a try with the understanding that if this does cause problems, so that would be involved basically no standing. Not, we're not talking about people getting out of their cars. We're not, we're talking about people not even sitting in their cars along this stretch. No yes, car, no a car, a car free zone, in a vehicle free zone. Yeah, no standing. Only passing, yes, understood. Okay. And Jim, can I ask a question? Oops, sorry. Realizing that, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're going to look at it from the whole picture, I mean, we're not trying to, I mean, the, your, your idea is a great one. Testing the people, getting this going, everything we can with the COVID to try to address the issue. So yes. it's a, it, you're, you're, you're doing a good thing. Yeah, what, what, we, we what if I... Need, we also Carolyn has Please something. let me finish. We also Sorry. need to address safety concerns from the general population. Otherwise, so realize that if this is causing an issue and your people can't prevent the cars from standing on the east side of Target, the zoning enforcement officer may come down and shut your project down if you can't address the issue. I just want to make you aware of that that concern, okay? Can I get tested if I pull up on my bicycle? You know, they're, they're trying to make uh, Route 9 very bicycle friendly. And all I hear is cars, cars, cars. What about bicycles or motorcycles or people? Township, township personnel can cut the line. Jim, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Asim, is... Um, just, uh, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. You're thinking 20 to 55 vehicles between nine and five? Well, that was the undershoot. Um, the reason being was that uh, I do know that the hype has gone down. And I also want to know um, physically by being open. Don't, that's the only way I'll know how yeah, much traffic. No, you know, I was just it. clarifying that. So you're, yeah. as people sign up, you're really looking, unless my math is way off, which is definitely a possibility. You're only looking at about five or six people an hour. Is that correct? Are they, is it on the hour that you're doing it or is it, you know, is it throughout the hour? I'm just curious how you're I, taking I hope those appointments. That, well, if, if the space gives me ability to test 200 people in a day, I hope that I'm going to be testing 200 people in a day and the schedules are booked that much. Um, I'm just giving an undershoot due to not knowing how much specific traffic would be actually coming to the location. Um, I'm going to have a schedule basis. So if somebody signs up, if somebody comes to the physical queue and wants to get tested, if they come through from the lot, it shouldn't take more than max five minutes for them to get tested and get out if there's no queue in front of them. If there's no queue in front of them. So that, so that kind of... 15 minutes would be testing, the actual that, test. That's my concern, Awesome. Um, and that's and it kind of goes along with what Carolyn was saying. Uh, there shouldn't be any question as to how many people are going to show up per hour or per day. Like you, you totally control that with your registration, your web based exactly. registration form. So yes. I think that's our concern as far as public safety goes. The fire chief and I, that's and as well as the zoning enforcement officer, to make sure that queue doesn't end up out onto Route Nine. And how you don't how how you don't know how many people are going to show up. You understand what I'm saying? Like you can control the appointments, and if you're not having walk-ins, then you literally have a schedule that says I'm accepting five cars per hour, and that's what I'm accepting. And once they're full, you go to the next hour. So that's concerning to me that you know it, it goes from we're guessing 25 to 50, and then it could be 200. Uh, realistically, it would be around 12 cars per hour if you put it on a five minute basis. I, I, I can't hear you. I'm, you're still muted. Sorry. Well, if you're at, I was just, you know, Carolyn's math is correct. I, I did the same math at the beginning. So if you're at 12 cars per hour, now you're at 100 cars per day. Um, so, I, you know, that's, what, that's my point is that you control how many cars show up. You control the queue. You yes. can know how many cars are in line. If you're talking about a 30 second or a one minute long you tip up your nose and out the door you go. Uh, if you have any delays in that, and now, especially with the fact that we got to stop cars, we can't let cars go into a 200 foot long area of that queue. 
if you have any delays, they're going to end up on Route 9. Um, so it really depends. You really have to have, I would personally feel comfortable seeing some type of schedule as to how you're going to control how many cars go, you know, go in there. It'll, it'll be specific to the schedule basis. So if I'm only going to be able to book 12 people per hour, those are the only people that are going to be able to come into the queue and get tested for that time being, since I have no walk-in basis available. Um, if those people are not in line, then they just missed out on their appointment and they're going to have to wait until the next available appointment. Um, it's going to be a strict guideline to ensure that I don't have any issues because I also know that if there are any issues, the place is going to get closed down. So it's my duty to make sure that <laughs> the traffic is moving and I have everything running up to par. I have a question for Mr. Dwyer. Do we have case history that we could approve him on a certain number or rate? You know, the, he can only and then he can come back to us if it's he can check in and if we're if it's working and he wants to increase it we can you know he can work with the town is there some caveat we can do like that yeah i think we can put in something uh as a condition of waiving site plan approval that uh, it must be by appointment there must be no traffic backup onto route nine i i think that's the key instead of trying to micromanage the numbers which is difficult for him and uh, who knows difficult for everybody if we could make the the main point that if any traffic backs up on route nine or shall not back up on the route nine yeah i'm, I'm think totally, totally fine with that i'm sorry mark i didn't mean to no, go. no that's fine mike fine go ahead that. That I completely agree with that. And as long as the fire chief, you know, there's a part of it that says they won't block the access to the, uh, to the hookup. I think both of us would be on board with that. I'm fine with that idea. Okay. Yeah. You want a question? Tommy, you want a question? You're muted. Well, I was going to ask if the stipulation could just say a certain to start off the first week, uh, three days or something with a certain amount of people since they can control that. And then whether it just be a quick zoom meeting after three days a week that we just, uh, increase it depending on how everybody thought it went along yeah, yeah so I'm we not, don't run into a huge trouble you know three days into it yeah I, i'm not sure we want to put a limit of number of cars or people what i think we want to do is stipulate the concerns east side of the east side of target clear nothing on route nine and if he can do that with a thousand cars a day do we really care as long as there's no safety and traffic concerns or maybe he only needs 10 people a day to meet that i don't know but instead of trying to put a limit, because that's, we don't know right. how traffic is going to flow, but right. we do know what we don't want. Right. We don't Did, want traffic on the east side of the mall, and we don't want anybody on Route 9. There's so many variables that it, it's, it's really hard to predict. So I think if it's interactive, that we're checking in with the municipal authorities uh, on some specified time period, that's that works for me as long as it satisfies Tommy and and the chiefs. Yeah, I don't know if we can put a, a check in period. The team it seems like a lot. I mean, I honestly gonna, don't, gonna, don't, I gonna honestly don't believe business. we're gonna need a check in period because if there's problems, we're gonna know about it. The the chiefs are going to know about it real quick, and yeah. so is the zoning enforcement officer. And likewise, mm -hmm. it's gonna roll downhill to us pretty quick. Um, I'm, I'm smiling because it's, it appears we're winding this up. And Jim Maximowski usually says, well, good luck in your business. This is one of the businesses we hope that it doesn't have good luck ultimately down the line. Uh, it's a noble effort, Amir. And uh, it's, it's something that's obviously needed in a timely fashion now. Listen, for some people, getting a COVID test is the social highlight of their day, okay? Well, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion to waive set, uh, waive further site plan approval for a testing site at Hampshire Mall with traffic flow as shown on the plan, which will be attached, with no standing along the uh, easterly side of uh, the Target building where the fire department connections are located. You may need to relocate access to the southerly circuit road if um, you can't keep the target east side clear. Uh, all testing must be by appointment, although that will be subject to review as circumstances change. Uh, 
and there must be no traffic back up onto Route 9. Perfect. Got it. I second the motion. Those are the points. Very good. Any other comments? Um, the only other thing I might add, Bill, is, and I don't know if I missed it, if you said, you know, something, you know, you did say if circumstances change, but I don't know that the litmus test should necessarily be backing up onto Route 9 because it could be backed up within the mall and cause traffic within the mall. So it, it, it might be something where it's, it's up to the chiefs. Um, I don't know if you can wordsmith that. Well, so the subject to review was just as to the by appointment. Um, as far as it goes within the mall. Um, That's the mall problem. That Well, you know, I, I'm sorry. Can I just jump in? Mark makes a great point. I, I thought of it, um, you know, earlier. And after you made the motion, Bill, I bit my tongue because I was like, if I say one more thing, they're going to they're going to kick me off the meeting. We're glad no, to we, have you. We, we, we good promise point. And, let you speak. It's a, it's a good point because in all reality that what's going to happen is, is we're going to get the calls, you know, the fire department and the police department are going to get the calls saying that there's cars backed up. There's no way you can get an ambulance through here. Um, you know, I'm trying to get to the to target. I'm trying to get here and I can't get there. The, the, the delivery truck drivers are going to call and complain. So I think Mark makes a great point in that there should be uh, some part of it just kind of stipulating that, there needs to be a way to fix that problem. Yep. Traffic shall not be backed up beyond the entrance of the Route 9 entrance into the mall. That means it can't go, it can't back up into the mall itself. In other words, it can't wrap, it can't wrap towards Trader Joe's. And the Route 9 entrance shall be maintained as shall be maintained open traffic back up on route nine or beyond the route nine entrance right in other words the Within where the, the entrance to the mall is on route nine that alley that aisle way for lack of better term shall be maintained open how would we sorry to sorry to and bring it down, but how would we be able to differentiate the traffic of the mall and my actual traffic in the case of there being traffic in any case? You know, there's three or four different ways you're going to be asked to access this queue. It's not necessarily through Route 9. You can come in through North Maple Street and come around and try to get in. Well, yeah. that, that's exactly true, Mike, but if, if the traffic backs up beyond the Route 9 entrance, it'll almost certainly be because of the COVID testing site. Why would could, be traffic, a, could be a good movie. Why would, why would traffic <laughs> in the mall be backed up in that entrance if they're not going to the COVID testing site? They were just going to come in and make a right-hand turn or go straight to Target. Or if they're new to the area, they may wander around the mall, but yeah, but humans are, are bad creatures. My sister down you get behind a wheel, you're driving. I mean, you're gonna go where the hell you want to go. They opened a they opened a Chick Fil A in my sister's town, and it just drove the chiefs there crazy because they were just backed up across two highways. It was there was no sense of reason. So I gotta yeah. get there. Okay. Well, well, I think subject to review, certainly if mm -hmm. it's going to start backing into the mall parking lots and all over the place, then the, there's going to have to be some some corrections. And I think Amir understands that. And I think awesome. if we try to micromanage every particular issue that may come up, uh, we can't do it tonight. Uh, but have Tommy indicate that he can give them the cease and desist order and we'll come back and make a more equitable arrangement. Okay. Yeah. I think if you have that subject to review, because there's going to be unforeseen things possibly. Yes, so, exactly. yeah, that, I think that's good. Well, we could also put in a review date of, uh, yeah, we can put this on the agenda for a month from now. How, how long do you think it's going to take you to actually get up and running? Um, the, the main thing would be the Google presence 
and uh, physically getting personnel to be on the lot. And then from there, I can, I can start up. So I'd say it would be a week process, realistically. How about the first meeting in March, Bill? You're, you expect to be operating within the next two or three weeks, Amir? Yes, if, 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 we get, if I get the proper approvals today, then yes, I would, I would expect to be open very soon. Put it on an inf informal review for the first meeting in March, Bill. We can always move it out. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, Tuesday, okay. March uh, 1st. And obviously, if anything happens earlier, we're going to hear from the building enforcement or the chiefs. So we can bring it up earlier. I don't well, the students, the the students will be back in a week. So that, that may uh. make, make it busier, too. I don't know how the rest of the process works, but does he have to like get the signage approved by Tommy or anything like that? Or can he just rock and roll? Signage would go through us, I think. Like his signage would go to us, we'd classify it as directional signs so that uh, and then eventually with a stipulation when he presents where they're gonna be, they'll come down after he closes shop and the pandemic goes away. Okay. I just, you know, all I, all I care about is uh, maybe getting a, an invite or, you know, shoot an email to Carolyn on the day you're ready to open just so we can, you know, take a look and see how, see how it looks. That's it. All, other than that, you know, I hope the chair of the, of the planning board is correct and that you get a thousand cars a day and everything works out swimmingly. I hope it comes down to that. When you, no, Amir, when here, you're ready to open, Amir, when you're ready to open, could you please send a planning uh, an email that you're going to be opening and we can distribute, we can distribute it to everybody. Okay. Sounds good. I just also wanted to just say one thing. My, my name is Asim. I'm sorry if it, uh, uh, it says, what, what is it? Amir on there, but my name is Asim, A-S-I-M. Oh, okay. it appeared as Amir on, on the screen. So yeah, oh, it says oh, Amir. Okay. sorry. I just, I just wanted to just clarify that. Um, Amir, okay. it's my mistake. I'm using huh? another phone. No, another phone. no sorry. Okay. We're, we're just going by the name on the screen, so we apologize. I know. I no, no, it was my fault. I just okay. wanted to clarify, just so you guys know that sure. my name is Austin for future okay. purposes. Awesome. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Do you have awesome. any Could idea ballpark how many people are tested daily in Hampshire County? Uh, I do not know. Okay. okay. It's curious. Yeah. So, awesome. Could you please send Bill, Mr. Dwyer, the planning of the email when you're ready to open, and we will distribute. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you all for oh, appearing. When are we going to make the vote? We have a motion and a one second. Last, one last thing. Oh, let me let me run through the motion one more time. Since okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Tommy's got a question. Yeah. Uh, Chief Mason had a great point. Uh, Mike, Mike and I, uh, Chief Bank and Able, always do a site visit all the time. And maybe this time a requirement the day before you open, if two chiefs and myself were invited as well as the administrator to check signage, check the way everything is. Just to you know, give it a heads up before you did it. Could that be uh, requested? Yes, that's that I've actually added that already. Reopening inspection. Yep. So um, traffic flow as shown on the plan. No standing along easterly side of target. Stay clear of fire department connections. May need to relocate access to Southerly Circuit Road if you can't keep the target east side clear. Must be by appointment, although that will be subject to review as circumstances change. No traffic backup on Route 9 or within the mall beyond the Route 9 entrance. And uh, review operational details prior to opening with public safety and building department and we'll see you back here on Tuesday, March 1. Although, uh, if we get uh, a clear uh, reports from everybody, uh, we can, uh, you won't have to, we can, we can waive that if, if it's working well. All right. I, I would only add one phrase that I think we talked about was that uh, the applicant will provide staff to manage the traffic outside, you know, so it, it's not just signs that if needed, they would have someone out on that triangle. 
So I think that's covered by the six, by by yeah, saying there'll I, be no standing, that, no standing along the east north side of Target. How they accomplish that? Yeah, that's is it. up is on them. Mark, no, no offense, but I think that's telling him how to run his business. Okay, okay. I think we should let him decide how to do that. And if right. signs don't work, he's going to be and if it, in trouble. And if it, right, and if it doesn't work, then the Chiefs can tell him that he needs someone. So, okay, sure. Yeah, okay. That is the motion. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for all your yeah. input. Could you email me that motion, Bill, so I can distribute yeah, it? I'll, to the I'll write something up. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll write something up after the meeting. That's fine. Yeah, that's what I mean. We don't need it now. Okay. So, awesome. Your last name is not K H A N, like your phone I says? I apologize. No, it's not. It's, it's Arshad, A R S H A D. A R S H A D? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Next. Now we get to Mr. Iser. Evening, gentlemen. Thank you guys. I have two items for your uh, discussion this evening. One's an ANR plan, one is a potential very small subdivision. Uh, I meet, emailed this stuff to you. Last week, hopefully, Mr. Dwyer can share. Okay, which one do you want to do first? Uh, let's do the A and R, please. Roosevelt Street. Pardon, Mike. Is that Roosevelt Street? Yes, sir. Let's see. I did open that. There. Oh, got to stop my first share. Okay. Okay, hang Almost. on a sec. <laughs> For some reason, it doesn't want to come as you go. That one doesn't want to go away. Now, let's see if I can make this work. Yes. All right. So this is 19 Roosevelt Street, uh, formerly owned by Frank Zalot. It's his daughters own it now. And there is not enough land there for two lots. So what's happening is the lot to the left called parcel B is going to be a not a separate building lot at the end of the, when we're all done with this process, that's gonna stay not a building lot for now. The intent in the future is to acquire some land from the abutter to the north who happens to be uh, uh, related, but that property is in an estate, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Dwyer? That is correct. Okay, so they're trying to deal with the estate before they can do any land transfers. So the, what I'm doing is setting this up so that in the future, this little parcel C can go back with parcel B to be a lot. But for now, parcel C is going to go with parcel A and be the lot with the house and the garage and the two sheds. At, when it's all said and done, parcel A and parcel C will have 175 feet of frontage, more than 30,000 square feet of area. The 150 foot square will fit in the lot without problem. Uh, and that's that. 
Wait, wait a minute. Explain that to me again. Right now, I see two parcels with 170 feet of frontage. Correct. And then, so parcel C, do you see that one, Jimmy? That triangle, little triangle at, yes. in between the two lots? Yes. Okay, so over, look over to the left where you guys, where you will sign, there's a note there that says parcel A and parcel C to be combined to form one undivided parcel. So Where's there will be, can, go ahead, Joe. See again, Randy, where is it? Where is what, Joe? Parcel C. Right it's down like, here. Right oh, okay. In between the two lots on the street. Okay. It's very hard to see. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's got 4.28 feet of frontage. You could put a doghouse on there. Yeah. Well, no, it's it, it would be within the front yard setback, Mark. We couldn't do that. <laughs> so anyhow, parcel A is the bigger portion. Parcel C is the smaller portion. They're going to be combined to form one lot. Down the road, hopefully, parcel C will be combined with parcel B, and then we'll get another similar parcel C to the north of this to add to parcel A. And I'm only doing this because when time comes to change it, the, the, the bank is going to want to release this stupid little triangle. So if I've got it spelled out already, I think it'll make everybody's life a little easier. I could be wrong. But that's my thought on it. Okay. Now, the only problem is the zoning bylaw specifically says that the frontage, if it's 175 feet, must go all the way to the rear of the principal structure. So giving 170, giving five feet that's about, I don't know, 20 feet long doesn't comply with the bylaw. Uh, okay. You need 175 feet for approximately 150 feet of depth, maybe more. Right. Okay. So it, I thought it was the 150 foot box that was the width. 150 foot box. However, frontage must be consistent all the way to the rear of the principal structure. Yeah, you know, there that that's true. But there is um, there is a glitch in that. Um in that we, we, we have that, we have the, the, we have the 175 feet of frontage, but our definition of lot width was not updated. I remember this came up once before. Um, so our definition of lot width is 150 feet. Thank you, because you're giving me a little bit of a, a heart attack here, because I I don't recall this. <laughs> but wouldn't, I that understand. Lot, wouldn't the lot width be overruled, depending on where you put the principal structure, by the clause that that Jim mentioned? No, and, Mark, Mark your, your question is, to the point, the reason for the uh, 150 by 150 square is that you would have an appropriate place to put the house. Okay. So if you, if, if you, let's say you have a front yard setback of 50 feet and you put a house there that's 20 feet deep, then by what Jim said, you need to be 175 feet back 70 feet. And then you can come back down to your 150. But the I think the bylaw says something about the rear of the principal structure, Mark. Yeah. And I believe that I, what I'm thinking is what Bill just said, that the bylaw stipulates that the width is the 150. I don't believe there's anything that, that's why when you emailed me, Jimmy, I was confused as to what you were talking about. I, I had no idea what you meant because I think I've done everything that uh, I understand the bylaw to require. Uh, I've got another computer. I'm trying to get the, the bylaw in front of me so I can read it again. But yeah. Jim, where is that? 4.3.7. 4. 
Okay, so width is defined such that a square 150 feet by 150 feet must be able to fit into the plan of a lot, and at least one point of that square must lie on the frontage line at no point between the front lot line and the rear of the principal structure. Located on a lot, shall the lot have a width less than the minimum lot width required? So it's 150 feet. But if there's a conflicting statement, then the court would have to decide which one rules. Well, it says, this says width is defined, where, and that's 4.3.7. So width is defined as 150 foot square. So that tells me that I've got to be at least 150 feet wide to the rear of okay, the okay. house. Okay, you're, you're, yes, you're right, minimum width. And in the table four, it has frontage depth, and then it has width. And width is 150 feet, whereas frontage is 175. Okay, you're right, and I was wrong. You're right. Okay. Okay, you, you owe me some blood pressure medication. It's confusing as heck, but that's uh, the way we, it's written. We just, Diogenes just had this lamp held up to an honest man. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So anyhow, at the end of the day, we're going to have the lot to the north or the right is going to have 175 feet of frontage, 150 feet of width, more than 30,000 square feet, and it will comply with all zoning. The lot to the left or the south is going to be nothing until some point in the future where hopefully it can get enough frontage to satisfy the bylaw. If it can't get the frontage, then it will remain not a buildable lot. Okay, my only question, that's, I don't like that. Because down the road, I mean, why are you doing, what, what's the need to do this until you can find out if you can get that five feet from the neighbor to the north? Well, the, the, my clients thought it would be in their best interest to have it this way. If the board disagrees, then I'm sure I can convince them otherwise. I mean, if there, it's going to be one lot right now, and when we're, I don't quite understand what we're signing off on if it's going to be one lot. Okay. Well, I mean, we're, so we're, again, the note, we're, the note we're, under we, where you sign. We appear to be intentionally creating two non conforming building lots, or at least one. One, definitely. No, and, and that is that, like I said, that parcel B is not a separate building lot. But if we take parcel A and combine it with parcel C, now we have a building lot. If that's too confusing, then I can just eliminate the parcel C and we'll deal with it down the road. Um, but I would like to ask Mr. Dwyer's opinion as to whether this would be easier to get a release from a bank or does it not matter, Bill? Um, yeah, I got to be careful with this one because I'm, I'm not participating uh, in the decision um, due to conflicts, but um, Well, I'm looking for in your experience and, and, and yeah. I understand where you're coming from. And if you if I, I, I just don't know, I don't deal with this enough to know what I've, the answer is. I, I don't think it's a big deal for a bank to, uh, you know, as long as, as long as it was sort of cleared in advance and everybody understood what was going on, giving a mortgage on the entirety. And then um, I think it might be harder to switch around if, if, if number 19 was mortgaged and then you were at both adding property and taking property away from it. Uh, that could be confusing. I recently went through that with a bank where the we're doing some land swaps to straighten out a property line. And um, yeah, it was, it was confusing. It might be easier if it, they're not as many variables to present to the bank. Meaning make it one lot? Make it one lot to start with and then 
Deal with it afterwards? Deal with it afterwards. Okay. So I'm just trying to think of I uh I'm just not remembering which bank uh I think it was East Hampton for what it's worth. Um, where we went through this, but, um, yeah, I'm kind of with Jim that I just don't see what the benefit of doing this now is, but then I'm kind of obtuse right now. So, <laughs> okay. Well, if it, if it's easier for you guys to deal with, we'll, I'll, I'll just make, the northern lot one, I'll take the parcel C out of there and just create parcel A will turn into lot one uh, with 175 feet of frontage and whatever the total uh, area is. And I will take the note off that I have underneath where the board would sign that says parcel A and parcel C to be combined. Parcel B will remain as it's shown, not a separate building lot, because that's just the way that is. Are you okay with that, Jimmy? I don't like it. I'm going to be honest. You don't like what? Creating a building lot. Like that, because down the road, I can see them going to the Zoning Board of Appeals and asking for a variance because it's a building lot and they don't have the right frontage where it was initially created to be non-conforming with a whole bunch of stipulations. I would rather see two 175 foot frontages. Okay, well, I can't do that. I don't have it. Then I'm saying we can't, I'm, I'm, I'm th I personally am not willing to sign this because it's, it's, we're creating a non-conforming lot. Well, I'm entitled to bring out. Well, I'm entitled to bring that to you as long as I stipulate on there that it's not a building lot, and then that's one where area where I put it, and then on, underneath where you guys sign, there's always a statement that says your endorsement does does not mean that we uh, comply with zoning when we create these parcels, and there is there's case law to this effect um and it's just it's just the the fact that there's not enough land left so uh and and i've talked to my clients they understand what's going on and this is one of those situations where if they were to go to the zoning board the zoning board should tell them there's no way you're getting a variance for this because you don't meet the criteria not to say that it won't happen, but technically, legally, there wouldn't be entitled to a variance. Yeah, I, I, I just don't understand why it's being brought to us before they get the whatever frontage they need to purchase from the estate to the north. Because they have a child living in the house that they want to sell it to, and the only way they can do it is by dividing it like this. What does the rest of the board feel? So you're going to put, you're going to, parcel A will become a building lot. Right? Yeah, parcel A will be called lot one. Parcel A will be called lot one. Parcel lot. B will become parcel A and will what? say not yeah. a separate building lot. Correct. And parcel C will go away. Parcel C will go away. Yes. And then at some point in the future, part of uh, lot one will get, you know, a five foot strip from the north. Correct. And then we'll be able or get a 10 foot strip from the north and give up a five foot strip from the south. Okay. Now, question if they want to sell parcel A and the purchaser doesn't want to give up these frontages. What's going to happen? Then parcel B will, will remain forever unbuildable.
think that's reasonable the way we're approaching it. Uh, caveat emptor, Barry beware, you know. So, Parcel currently, B might, Parcel B might be a good place to plant asparagus, you know. Mark, you had a question, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I zoned out at the beginning, Randy. I'm sorry. So it, currently, what's there? Is there currently that line down the, down the center? And you're just no. adding, or it's currently just one lot? Currently, it's one big, big lot. Okay. Just a little history. Frank Zala was a longtime postmaster in Hadley, Boy Scout leader, uh, World War II veteran. Um, That's irrelevant. Well, I, but I'm just trying to put a little perspective. People want to know who Frank Zala was. He was a great, great citizen of Hadley. He had a skating rink on that property every day. I, I'm not, it's, it's irrelevant to this, certainly, but it's not that, irrelevant that, to remember all, Frank Zala. That is all very true. Okay. Motion? Well, would we agree to, to this if it was someone who was not an upstanding character in the history of the town? You know? that would no, be my irrelevant. point is, I like it to is, remember Frank Zell and his brother Joe was the principal of Hopkins Academy for many years. So just for people new to town, a little history, that's all. Yeah, the, the history of Mr. Zalot is irrelevant to the project in front of us. Of course it is, but it's, it might be of interest to some people. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Maybe you could share that after we vote. <laughs> okay. Somebody want to make a motion? Yeah, I, I'm going to abstain on this one. Do so, Randy. Can you with, withdraw it and uh, come back with one A and R, or would you rather not do that? So what I would like to do is just with the understanding that parcel C is going to go away, and then parcel A will become lot one with enough frontage, and then what's shown as parcel B is going to remain parcel B, and I'll put not a separate building lot 20 times on there if you want, so that it's not, nobody can miss it. But I, I, I firmly believe that this plan is entitled to endorsement by the board. I think, I think you may be right, Randy, and uh, the ANRs don't necessarily make it a qualification as the building lot now nor in the future but when something appears before us as an ANR we have to sign it is that correct bill well, sure if if it has adequate frontage and one lot will have adequate adequate frontage and one will not okay. and it's only a coincidence here that the one that doesn't have adequate frontage has 170 feet um if if it were 17 feet and randy was talking about it might we may convey it to the neighbor or something like that i think we we'd sign it um it's just the 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 catch is there's only only one building lot can be can be created here but as long as one has uh not a separate building lot endorsement i think you're okay well I'll make that motion. <laughs> I don't want, you know, if it isn't a separate building lot, then it's, it's not a separate building lot. Just make that bold lettering there. And I think we can go forward. Why not? Are we, are we making parcel a non-compliant because parcel C is not included? Parcel C, no, is, not parcel included. C is going to, Parcel C goes with parcel A, so the parcel A is in compliance. Okay. Parcel B is not in compliance. Okay. What's wrong with that? Nothing? Okay. Ugh. I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it for more discussion if necessary. Well, you're, you're seconding it for a vote for a vote. I'm just hoping it doesn't set a 
precedent. There's kind of hard to set precedent in zoning. <laughs> um, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 I guess so. Yeah. Any opposed? I'm technically opposed, so I'm going to say nay. And Mr. Dwyer can't participate. So the motion passes three, one, one. One absent, one nay. Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Okay. You're a very small subdivision, Randy. <laughs> yeah, we're we'll going to have to wait for Mr. Dwyer to put that on the screen. <laughs> Well, I was undecided. My vote was almost, I'd never been a deciding vote before. Yeah. Wow, you could have gone down in history. Who knew that project was going to be so... <laughs> yes. That's like the Whatever. Selective, selective service draft mark in World War II passed by one vote. Not many people know. Really? Yeah. Wow. I've, I've got a friend who lives in Sweden who still still votes in, in Hadley, and I think there was a Gazette article about him because his vote decided an election like 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. Well, oh, okay. Up, Randy? Yeah, so this is just for discussion this evening, minimal discussion. <laughs> I just want to see if the board will entertain the thought of a very small subdivision. This is at the corner of Mount Warner Road and North Maple Street. Where's North uh, Where's Mount Warner Road? Mount Warner Road is to the left. You can't see the, the text is pretty small. Uh, it's- it, it says it Yeah, here. right there. Yeah. So the this, this subdivision road would be on North Maple Street. Uh, there are several lots in there which uh, this is uh, Jack Kirschless who passed away a couple of years ago. He was the one who bought Lesko's garage and you dealt with his wife on transferring that over to Paul Naris. She owns this now. Um, so there are several lots on North Maple street, which they acquired from UMass, which have restrictions on them that they cannot be built on. Uh, but apparently this roadway between two of the lots is not subject to that. So the she's what I what I've shown you is that if I follow the subdivision regulations, I can get six lots out of this property and still have a bunch of land left over to the north. Um, so she would like three lots instead of six, and all the rest of the land would be put into a conservation restriction so that it can never be built on. And again, I'm just here to broach the subject to see if you guys are willing to entertain that. So Randy, a uh, little bit more clarification. Where is her house? Um, her house is, I've can you see it. where lot one is? Keep going, Je Abel, next, keep going up, next big lot, right there. That one right there, okay. There's, that's a brick house there. Right, right. Now, is this is this land, the land in APR? No, it is not. Is is the land to the north of it in APR? I believe it is. So, that's kind of defining. So it, this is the land that you think is in APR? I think so, Bill. Okay. And you're and, showing us six lots, but you said she only wants three. And in, in doing so, what we've typically done in the past, Mark, I don't know if you've been party to any of this. No. The board will waive not quite all, but most of the subdivision regs so that we don't have to build a 26 foot wide paved road, blah, blah, blah. We just basically make it a private road with a driveway. Oh. I personally would love it to be six so we could get a contribution to the uh, housing trust. That's my, exactly my opinion, Mike. I am not in favor of waiving small subdivision here. I would rather see the six lots put in. Okay, okay. One, another question for Randy. The, uh, the building lots uh, right on North Maple Street, 
Yes, sir. Uh, what about those? They are not buildable. They, they were acquired by UMass when they bought Young Farm. And when they sold them, they said these are never to be built on. Okay. That's because just... they had been built on. Yes, and they <laughs> Yes, they had. Yeah. Oh, is, this, no... is this where Berkham's Folly was? No. Oh. no. It was his predecessor. Oh, okay. Someone else's folly. Okay. But uh, the three uh, three houses were built there on unperkable land, and um, uh, no one quite knows how they got a building permit, but they did, and they never achieved a sewer connection. Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to the question of exactly, Bill. You're are right. Huh? Any of those lots perkable? Yes. Exactly right. I believe I believe so. The front on the road is very clay, but back there is very sandy. That, that kind and of that would be. Have they been perked? I don't believe so, but that would obviously have to happen before they could be built on. That, that kind of it's, goes up a little bit of a hill there, doesn't it, Randy? Mm, kind of, but not too much. Oh, really? Okay. But the, I'm I've told they, they've dug there, and it's full of red sand. <laughs> Okay, well, but I mean, by 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 uh, waving the subdivision regs does not give them carte blanche with the other things that would have to happen, i.e., board of health, septic systems, etc. Right, but I, I'm agreeing with Mike. I would rather see six lots go in. Okay, and the rationale being at six because lots, then we get one 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 uh, affordable unit in town for that. Okay, gotcha. Um, and that's the that is my 100% reason, yeah. My reason, so. so I will uh would say that for a street serving six lots, I would be worried that that's a entering onto North Maple Street at that corner. Um, I'd worry about, I'd have serious traffic worries there. There's a lot of fast moving traffic in there. And um, I'm just concerned that the spacing between the, uh, between uh, Mount, uh, Mount Warner and the new street is uh, too tight when the uh, North Maple is such a high speed street. Yeah, but it's a straight shot. It's not like there's any curves or anything like that. It's, it's a very high visible, visible visibility area. Yeah, uh, I'm just I just think they're they're close. But um, what is the distance between the curb cuts? Oh, let's see, one seventy five, three fifty, probably five or six hundred feet mark. Okay. Thank you, oh, we want to put a stop sign at the front of the uh, subdivision. Well, we got to get to that point before we worry about well, I'm just sign. thinking ahead, that's all. So, Randy, uh, the alternative of three building lots versus six, uh, do you have a layout for the three? I don't. I, I didn't want to spend any time until we got it figured if we were going to go there or not. Uh -huh. So, in the the trade-off is how much open space would we get and would it be uh, from a noticeable, would it, or would it just be a brush after? So. Well, that, I mean, I know Divine haze it now yep. and there's the big chunk to the north, that big open blue space that's got no, no numbers or anything in it. That's part of this property. So that's, probably six ish acres or so there. And then there'd be three lots gone, which are all a minimum of an acre. So you're looking close to 10 acres. I have not been through this process before where I feel like we're being baited with the six lots 
but you're showing this because this is this is going by the ordinance. And if you dropped it down to three, then you wouldn't have to do as wide of a r road and it would just be a private way. Is that what you're? Yes. And t we, we've done this, I don't know, four or five times probably, Mark. Mm -hmm. And that usually I haven't come before the board with a, a magic number that will trigger uh, this uh, affordable housing thing. Right. So. Um, so if you, if you had just come to us with a plan showing three lots, you're showing this to us because if you had done that, we would have said, why didn't you do six or. No, no. What I'm trying to do, typically what happens is the board will look at it and say, all right, we're going to have three less houses in town. We're going to save three more acres of land. Mm. And the trade-off for that plus the additional six or seven acres is we will waive the subdivision regs so that it's not as costly to build. And then the town doesn't have to maintain it either. It becomes a private road and the town is out of the uh, maintenance aspect of it. Got it. So your, your client is showing us what they're willing to give up in terms of correct yeah profitability exactly okay. right got it i'm a little dense but <laughs> <laughs> but but you're willing to let them let the holes get drilled in so that's yeah. okay <laughs> i'll be smarter next time so uh randy just thinking out loud here the the, the, the bylaw says you got to have a house on every lot with certain frontage if you if you could create something differently here, what would you put in here versus six houses or three houses? So the I can't uh, disregard the zoning bylaw. No, but so if you I'm, could, what would what would be ideal here rather than having six houses, cluster housing, condos, something like that? Well, if you if if. If it were possible to put three houses on smaller lots and preserve more land, I'm sure that my client would be willing to do that. Yeah. We unfortunately don't have that. No. The, the minimum, I mean, that's in the aquifer down there. So it's 200 feet of frontage and 40,000 square feet is the minimum we can work with. Yeah. Well, see, I, I just at, think that we, we can't do it now, but this board has to look at ways to put to not have to have as much land to put houses on because it's it's not going to be there in the future well well mike this is uh this is very hypothetical because the argument many years ago was the fact it couldn't perk so yeah you had to gotcha. put, put a sewer in so yeah. well, even even if it even if we knew it perked, then yep. we get into Title V issues. Yeah, exactly. Which right. Title V says you got to have 10,000 square feet of land for each bedroom in a house. So, three bedroom house, you got to have 30,000 square feet. Four bedroom house, you got to have 40,000 square feet. So, you're kind of locked in there as well. If it was on sewer, then what you're talking about, Mike, would make a whole lot more sense. Yeah. Just saying, you know. Oh, Randy, what's, what's six houses? How boring! Those numbers again, Randy. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, your the numbers again uh, for Title Five. Yes, ten thousand square feet per bedroom. There are a lot of houses, student stuffers, I call them, that don't qualify in town. But uh, that's yeah. You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you're not kidding there. Yeah, but that that's neither here nor there on this know, particular I, topic. All right. So if you build three or six houses here, it's it's adding burden to the town infrastructure for schools and. Uh, I don't think I, that's a problem. I you know I think we want want some kids in town. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the class sizes are going down. We've got to have, have enough uh, populace well, generated to us uh, fill, fill the schools now. Mike, you can adopt a couple. 
Well, I, you know, I'll ask my well, wife. That's, <laughs> okay. that's part of the uh, reasoning for doing the the uh, very small subdivision is there'll be three less houses and then three less, however many multiples of kids potentially to uh, put a burden on the taxes, tax base of the town. So anyhow, I don't, uh, I don't follow that. Back, but back, I, I'm, to topic, I'm, back to the topic at hand. Yes. Yes. Okay. We, we digress. Okay. We, we got to get moving on this meeting because we got a lot of stuff to discuss and we're spending way too much time bullying about things that aren't appropriate. Um, okay. Why are your comments? I think um, I, I gave my comments. I'm okay. concerned about the proximity of the uh, two streets either way. Okay. Well, so you're, my you're feeling is this, this is an ideal situation where we can't allow a waiver so that something doesn't come into the uh, housing trust. So I'd be against three houses. I'd be in favor of six. Okay. Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Dwyer is in favor of the three, apparently. Mr. Zagrodnik? Uh, probably in favor of the three so we could preserve more open space. Okay. Mr. Dunn? I'm, I guess my, my largest concern is the, the distance. I think, well, I think you said it's 600 feet from the, from Mount Warner. So if this is a three house driveway instead of a six house street, I guess I'm less concerned about the traffic. It, it, but it's not like people are going and go in and out 24 seven. Right. I mean, one of the big concerns where I live now or, or the place on Middle Street was that people are going to be coming and going. Come over here and see how many cars live, live, live leave East Street Commons daily. Maybe maybe 10. No. I, and, and when uh, when Mr. Roberts was presenting his project for whatever it was, 27 or 28 Middle Street um, units back behind. Uh, yeah. I thought that was too much traffic dumping out. That's not an issue here. So I guess I'm in support. Yeah, six or three. Which one are you in support of, Mark? The three or the six? Well, I would certainly prefer the six, but I'm, I don't think I would vote against the person's right to develop three. I would prefer the six. That's not, that's not the question. Okay. So the question being asked... We, we, we have two votes in favor of the three, two votes in favor of the six. Oh, here I am again. So you need to, you need to, I, I put the pressure on you, buddy. Okay. Which, oh, one, okay. which one would if you I vote may. for? Yeah, if I may. Hey, which one Jimmy, are you suggesting me... Mr. Isaac pursue? Mar let, make sure Mark understands what he's voting in favor of. Since he's never done this before, I don't want to try to push something down his throat that he's not aware of. What I'm asking you to do, Mark, is to waive the majority of the subdivision regs in, right. in order to do the three instead of the six. Yep. So, or in exchange for doing the three instead of the six. So I just make sure you understand what you're, you're voting on or yeah. op opining Mark, on. Yeah. yeah. Mark, Mark, do you understand what the differences are yet? Would you like me to explain them a little bit? Yeah, if we don't waive, then they would have to build a subdivision and we would get a, a, a proper road. And if they did six instead of, or if they did, you know, six instead of five, there would be a housing in lieu of, right? So. Right. Right. So the, it, 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 it's I mean, a bit it, more nuanced than that. Mm, yeah, they, they functionally have the right, as long as they comply with our subdivision regulations, they have the right to build six, uh, to uh, develop six lots, mm -hmm. assuming they all perk. Uh, but in order to do that, they would have to build a road to subdivision standards mm -hmm. to serve those uh, six lots. And... But, like Megan's way. Yeah. <laughs> and that's going to be expensive. Uh, that's, whereas 
the trade-off is if we let them do, if we let, if we agree that um, to let them build the road to functionally uh, the standard of a driveway, they will agree to not exercise all of their development rights. So th that's the trade-off, really. Now, the, the caveat as well could be if they build six lots, one of them must go into the affordable fund or affordable housing. However, should they decide, well, we don't want to do that. We're only going to put in five lots. That's also an option for them. So it could be five lots. It could be six lots, or it could be three with the waiver. Of the very small subdivision. Well, at, at what point do they have to contribute to the trust when we give six them? lots? What? Yeah, six. We don't. I don't care if you don't build anything. You still got to contribute to the trust. No. No. Six lots. The way the bylaws, the way the zoning bylaws written right now, is six lots. Yeah. Anything less than six, they don't need to do anything. Right. But we're, if we give them six lots, they have to do something. Right. But if they decide they only want to put in five. They could do that as well and not contribute. But they would have to build it to full subdivision standards. Correct. If we're serious about this uh, affordable housing in Hadley, then I mean, I don't see how you can vote. At least I can't vote in favor of um, waiving, waiving the, the uh, subdivision standards. I'm I'm gonna lean towards the six, I guess. Okay. okay. And I, th I think Jimmy, I think Bill's against it. I don't think he's in favor of it. That's right. So the, the, right now, the, the the comments are three and two. Three uh, three for the six, and two for the for the three. Who's the two for the three? Joe and who? Bill. Hey. Oh, Bill, you are in favor? Oh, of the okay. three, of the very small. The, the small. Okay, yes. all right. I miss Adding understood. a driveway is one thing. Adding a full subdivision road. Okay, okay. Uh, I misunderstood. Okay. Okay, so that sounds uh, like uh, it's not going to happen. If, if, I'm, if I can count my votes correctly, three against and two for... I think we're done here. <laughs> okay. Well, or you could you could you could put in a uh, five lot subdivision by right. Well, yeah, that I get. Right. No, I understand that. So, but I was here to discuss the the small subdivision. So it sounds like the board is not in favor of it. So uh, I will talk to my client and we'll see what we do, if anything, to move forward. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, that's all I have, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. So, I would say uh, there are a number of. Let me get this. There are a number of people here. Um, I am um, thinking that a certain number of them are here for the public hearing on the battery storage. I would agree with that. Is there anyone here who uh -huh. has stuck with us who has a question for the planning board that is not related to anything else on the agenda? The, the open, uh, open session question. Hi, um, my name is Dale Eddy. I am with NEXAMP. We were asked to come to this meeting, and my colleague Rob Ritchie is also with NextAmp. We were asked to come to this meeting to answer any of your further questions about our approved solar and energy storage system right. on uh, South Maple Street. Right for the ba the battery, what, adding the battery storage to it. Correct, but different different battery storage than the public hearing. Right. So the question we got a couple of questions on it. Um, one is uh, you're using, you're not using liquid cooling, you're using refrigerant cooling? Yes, that's correct. Um, so 
maybe just a little bit of background. Um, the solar portion. Who are you project, exactly? Who who are you? Are you an, are you an engineer? Or? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm a senior associate with Nextamp's energy storage team. Not engineering specific, more uh, business development. Rob Ritchie, also on the phone, is the director of energy storage with Nextamp. And we both have been involved in the past with the, the permitting of this project. Okay, proceed please. Yeah, so in 2017, um, the solar portion of the project was approved. In 2019, we got approval for the energy storage portion of the project. Um, we came to you guys in December to just discuss a slight site, site plan change um, that has to do sort of with the utility equipment associated with interconnecting the system to the grid. Um, we're not proposing anything different from what was already approved. There's, there's no changes to the energy storage system itself. Um, there are going to be two one megawatt, 2.2 megawatt hour containerized energy storage systems, and they do not have liquid cooling. They have um, an HVAC system that's integrated into the design and containerized system. How much noise will these uh, systems create? The cooling systems. Um, yeah, the cooling so, so I don't necessarily have specs specific to the HVAC system, but the whole system itself, including those HVAC units, um, are estimated to, to cause less than 77 dBA at a one meter distance. Based on the research Rob and I have done, it looks like a standard residential system, HVAC system, would um, be 72 to 78 dBA. So it falls in the normal range uh, of what you would hear from, from a house. How far away are you from a house? Do you know? Um, from, yes. I mean, I, how, how far will these units be away from a house is a better question. Yeah. So, um, it's, we estimated about a quarter of a mile from the condos on Green Leaves Drive, I believe. Um, we are closer to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Building, and that will be about 450 to 500 feet. Um, and then over 700 feet to the Wyndham Hotel, which is just a little bit north. Okay. Okay. So you said two one megawatt batteries? Correct. Which is enough energy to run, talking about air conditioners, uh, probably 1,200, 1,300, 5,000 megawatt air conditioners an hour, right? If converting megawatts to BTUs, which I've done. Hmm. And that's a lot of energy to be stored that close to places where people are working, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, Rob, maybe you want to speak to this. Sure. Yeah, this is actually one of our um, our smaller systems. We have systems significantly larger um, that are being deployed. But the, the good thing about it is it's relatively centrally located within the site. So it's, it's far from the, the property boundaries. Um, and, you know, we've built in the, the safety mitigations into these systems that are um, really top of the line to, to what the, the state um, requires and, and what has now become industry standard above and beyond what the state requires. And safety is really one of our, um, you know, our biggest points of concern. That's why we met with Chief Spank Nebo before uh, coming before the planning board originally in 2019, reviewed everything um, with him. You know, we have sensors that are, you know, we're going to be monitoring 24-7 um, to keep an eye on these systems. We have fire suppression uh, built in. We have, you know, in the case of um, something escaping that containment, um, a, a dry standpipe where the fire department can hook up to it from a safe distance and be able to put water directly into these containers to make sure that there is no issue. So safety's definitely been a, a key concern for us and a key part of our design and planning. Now, you're, the, these, you're, you're actually going to be storing the electricity you create on site into these batteries, correct? Correct. Correct. It's going to be 100% powered by the solar energy that's generated. On your site. That's correct. You're not drawing it from the grid. We're not. Okay. Chief. I mean, if, you know, basically we had the questions we had was noise and a type of cooling. Because um, some systems, okay. So you're, you're, you're pretty, you're a free on system. Yeah. So I, I think that raises the question 
because at the, the December meeting, I believe there was an additional condition requested that we have a containment system if there were liquid cooling. Um, since we're not using liquid cooling, would that condition not apply? Wouldn't apply, I don't think, no. Uh, but, it probably should. What if one of the batteries explodes? Do you do you want to contain it, or you just are, they, are these wet are these wet batteries or dry batteries? No, there, there's not. You know, the, there's a very very small liquid electrolyte inside the batteries, um, but it's not a substantial amount of liquid. It's not anything that would leak and that would pool or accumulate. What does a very small amount of electrolyte mean? <laughs> Not even measurable. If there were a if there were a fire, it would burn off. Chief Spanknibble, is water what you would use if there was an electrical fire? No. Uh, if one of these batteries was basically, we're trying to prevent thermal runaway, so that's when one of these lithium ion batteries overheats. The system that they have, they monitor these so closely that normally. They can isolate it and shut it down before it gets to that point. Um, UMass was the first. There was a one megawatt battery storage on Mullins Way that we had to deal with. What they've, what I think came out of that was they've started putting in a deluge system for so it's just dry heads. It's there's no water to them. They pipe a standpipe for us outside of the hazard area. So if it should happen to get to this thermal runaway stage, we can just fill it with water because at that point. There's, there's no reason to, you know, we're not worried about electrical charges on for us. It's just not allowing it to, we're trying to keep it from impacting the other batteries. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So at that point, the power would have been cut off to it if it's overheated and turning into a fire. Okay. But you still got the, energy inside the battery how do you dissipate the energy if you've got a problem well that's that's what we learned from this for and that's why this deluge system is being installed is they uh there was a stop work order done at umass because we had firefighters in arizona that were dealing with thermal runaway they had been monitoring and and uh keeping an eye on the container where they had reported, you know, heat in a thermal runaway situation. Nothing was found on their heat sensors. The firefighters opened the door to the container and there was a violent explosion. Um, that kind of put the brakes on everything uh, with us, with moving forward until we figured out how we can stay out of the hazard area. So, like I said, all of this can be done remotely. That's why our hookup is outside of the hazard area. We are strictly just trying to cool it so we don't have battery after battery after battery starting on fire so are these batteries encased in anything or are they just oh what do they look like are they open to the air or is there a container a, a, a sarcophagus holding them or something <laughs> something like that <laughs> yeah it's in a, a steel and concrete um container so it's it's enclosed it's you know weatherproof okay. um and everything yeah. okay i mean you, are I mean, you going to have you, any advertising on those batteries? I mean, <laughs> you, I mean, you, you, you've answered our questions. I mean, we don't need to give you another approval. We just wanted to know what was going on and get details on it. So I'm, I'm okay about the rest. You got to sign by law. I want to make okay. sure you don't paint something on all these battery structures. <laughs> oh, well, our, our company colors are Nexamp orange. So you know, big bright orange battery. How's that sound? No, just kidding. Oh, yeah. Be so, a good uh, scarecrow. Thank you, Crosser. Okay. Thank you. So I'll Thank make you. a motion to remove the curbing requirement since there doesn't seem to be anything to contain. Okay. Second. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So the curbing will, Mr. Tommy, the curbing doesn't have to be built, just for your information. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Have Thank a good you. night. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Chief. Is everyone else here for the battery storage? On Breckenridge. On Breckenridge, yeah. Or is there anybody who isn't here for that? I am Tom Corbett with Zero Point. Maybe Ken. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll read the public, the 
the uh, public hearing notice. The Hadley Planning Board will conduct a Zoom public hearing on Tuesday, December 7, 2021, beginning at 6.45 p.m. Purpose of the he hearing is to review the application of, that's the wrong one, that's Hanwich. <laughs> Sorry about that. I grabbed the wrong public notice. There we go. The planning board will conduct the Hadley Planning Board will conduct a public meeting, Zoom public meeting on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, beginning at 6:45 p.m. Purpose of the meeting is to review the application of ZP Battery Development Company LLC for special permit site plan approval, wide-scale solar energy storage, and use in aquifer for a proposed five megawatt solar energy battery storage facility off Breckenridge Road, also known as the gravel pit. Plans are available by emailing planning at Halley MA or the Halley Town Clerk's Office during normal business hours, published twice in the Gazette, because December 14th and 21. Gentlemen, you may begin your presentation here. Tom Corbett here with Zero Point Development, and I also have Kevin McGarry from Fuss and O'Neill, our uh, civil engineer here with me as well. Um, so we came to you in December, uh, I believe it was December 7th meeting and proposed uh, for, went in front of you for a meeting date. Uh, we kind of reviewed a little bit of the project, but I'll just run through our uh, whole spiel here. So we're talking about Breckenridge, the east side of Breckenridge, um, just north of the park off Huntington. Uh, it's 99 acre lot. Um, the site is roughly about a half acre um, disturbance. Um, so we'll have a access road coming in off of Breckenridge um, and to the right of that access road. Actually, Bill, if you could give me... Um, you should be set up for it. Okay. All right. Good deal. Let me get this in front of you. Oh, let's see it. Here with me. I'm not very good at this part. <laughs> All right. Um, you guys see this? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we've got Breckenridge um, over to the right of the screen here. Um, we're on the east side of Breckenridge Road, right north of Huntington. So we'll be coming in with an access road, existing access road that's there. Uh, we'll be clearing just a little bit on the north edge. Um, for the interconnection equipment with national, uh, with Eversource, sorry. Um, and then that will go underground out back to the site where we'll be utilizing a current um, laydown area, uh, previously disturbed area. Uh, there's an existing um, depression in the ground they'll be utilizing for a stormwater basin. And there'll be a pipe underneath that road there as well to go across. Excuse me, can you use your cursor to to indicate the areas you're talking about? Sure, let me uh, zoom in just a sec here. Get to the site. So here on the site, uh, we've got the access road coming in along here, the south edge. Um, and then right here will be our access into the site. So that will be a um, rocked uh, riprap kind of drive just for, um, construction purposes um, and then we'll get into here to the gate and there's a 24 foot drive aisle here um, and then you've got your containers your four container pads that will have a total of eight um, battery containers on here and then right to the south of that is all the um, electric electrification equipment uh, transformer recloser um, our monitoring system and the two um, control panels for the services so this is a this basin proposed basin here is an existing depression in the ground. There's an existing pipe going across the road um, to the east. Uh, we'll be doing major improvements on that east side outlet. Um, I think that's to the west. Oh, sorry, <laughs> to the west. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll be um, improving that, uh, putting a. Uh, level spreader there, building that up a little bit better so that has a better outflow and create more of a sheet flow over, over land after that. Um, 
So I guess we're here to have some discussion around the project. Um, you guys have had this in front of you. We've had Berkshire Design Group uh, review everything. We've got a clean bill of health from them. Uh, the only outstanding comment, which is pretty typical, is um, the development of a emergency response plan with the fire department, which is what we do upon mechanical completion of the project on site with our, um, our um, energy um, energy safety resource group. Um, there are consultants that we deal with. So they'll be on site uh, doing an on-site training and developing that ERP with the Hadley Fire Department and Police Department as well. Um, other than that, really, um, the technology around this, um, they are lithium iron phosphate batteries, um, pretty advanced technology around the whole system itself. Um, it's all, all tracks itself. There's battery management systems um, at the cellular level, at the modular level, and the, the rack level. So there's algorithms that create data. They get um, data sets every second, uh, thousands of data sets, and um, they can predict faults in the system. They can tell you the state of health of the battery cell as well. So the technology around this is pretty uh, far ahead of everything else that's out there right now. Um, it's a very cool unit. Um, uh, other small area. Um, but this here, they're liquid-cooled systems. Um, they have um, dry standpipes as well for the fire department. I met with uh, the fire chief and Tom Quinlan back in November, I believe it was like November 30th, we met on site and had the discussions about the project. And that was pretty much the biggest point was the standpoint, the standpipes being implemented for water suppression on the potential for a thermal runaway. Um, site design wise, a little bit getting into that. Um, we've got a fenced in area, this entire um, system is fenced in. Um, on the outside of this fence here, we have a recharge area minimum of 50 feet before we get to the stormwater structure. Um, so I guess that's kind of the project as a whole. Um, open to any questions that the board might have. The okay. part you're showing now, that's where the pole is, where you're coming off the grid? Um, right here, yes, correct. Yes. So there, we'll be coming across the street, setting one pole, um, and then there'll be pad-mounted equipment from there. So there'll be uh, pad mounted versus pole mounted. So there won't be like six poles going down the driveway. There'll be four pieces of equipment, most likely three with a meter um, next to it. Okay, I got a question for you. There's no, you're not having any solar panels on site. Is that correct? No, no solar panels on site. Scandal. I don't see where you comply with the solar energy bylaw because you're just taking power from the grid and storing it. You're not specifically taking solar power. And I don't see where you qualify under section 28 of the zone bylaw where you qualify just to put battery storage in. Um, Can you tell me where the specific section you comply with to allow this use? Because I don't see it. I have a zoning determination letter for you, but um... Let me uh, double check here. I don't think I really have it in front of me in the bylaw section. Excuse me, just a second. Find it in my mess of papers here. If they do comply, Bill, doesn't this mean that just about anybody in Hadley could put one of these uh, in, on their property if they have a sufficient area? Just as, as long they, as they were in the aquifer? Just as they can put up um, solar panels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Might be a what? good business to get into. I, 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 under The only thing that comes close is solar energy system. The last definition in the section section twenty eight point three solar energy system is right. what. How, however, 
This specific sentence says all equipment, machinery, and structures utilized in connection with the conversion of light to electricity. You are not converting light to electricity. You're simply grabbing power off of the grid that's created with whatever way it's created around here. You do not, you're not saving solar power. You're just saving electricity. Um, this was the step that I did here. So I went to Tom Quinlan and we addressed this whole thing and I have a zoning determination letter from him beforehand of this. So I guess I'm confused. How, you, you're talking, okay, Tom Quinlan was, that was his interpretation. However, you're dealing with the zoning with the, with the planning board. And as a member of the planning board, I don't believe that this battery storage complies with section 28 of the bylaw because you are not creating any electricity by solar. We're it's absorbing it. Yeah, we're absorbing the energy from the solar. From the grid. That is those. correct. I don't believe you comply. I don't believe this is a permitted use without solar panels on your site. So if he put one solar panel in there? No, he, he, he needs to have five megawatts worth. Uh. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might interject. Um, so, for the record, my name is Kevin McGarry. I'm a light system professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am a project manager at Fuss and O'Neill, and my personal background is in land development um, and stormwater design, which does include um, a lot of solar. So, we sort of get this question a lot about because it's a sort of off site storage as opposed to it sounds like. <clears throat> excuse me, the presentation that was before you just earlier sounded like it was a battery storage unit at the site of an array. These, um, this particular project, you're correct, it is hooked into the grid, but given that the grid is connected to other solar arrays throughout the community, what these battery storage systems do is they still continue to absorb the excess electricity that's generated from solar arrays during those peak production hours, during the middle of the day, store said energy and then discharge it back out into the grid at night. So yes, it's not directly connected like it would be if it was on site, but the system is still absorbing through the grid, the excess energy. And that's well, all but done within the regulations of Eversource and National Grid. So aren't you kind of saying that if you milk your goats and you put your goat milk into the tank with all the cow's milk, and then you take some of the milk out, you say, I'm, I'm only taking my goat milk out? Um, I didn't quite follow that particular metaphor. Um, <laughs> but, but, but like, it's, so, and again, we can further clarify, but, but that's, that's the way these, these systems work. And this is a fairly common, um, again, just for background information, this is a fairly common um, project that's happening throughout the state right now. Do, doesn't ever source generate what's needed at any moment in time? Don't they have, don't they have that capability? Yes. So, you're taking, you're taking, you're, so, so what you just said is not correct. There's no excess electricity being generated at any point in time. Yes, there is a, a excess gener a generation all the time during the day, during solar hours. The energy is not getting consumed as much as it's being produced and during the peak demand hours at night. I think when... that's the point. I think the point that Bill, uh, Jim made is that you don't qualify under the zoning bylaw. Therefore, I'll, I, I'll be I, against I this. I fully understand what you're saying, and I understand how the system works. However, our zoning bylaw is specific. It says utilized in connection with the conversion of light to electricity. So you are not converting light to electricity on your site. Um, I understand how the system works. I'm not disputing what's going on. However, that's what our bylaw says. And under that definition, I don't see that this is a permitted use.
even though it could be storing energy that's converted from sunlight, it's just from an off-site location. That's correct, because it, it, this, this, in, this implies that it's being done on site. The definition implies it's being done on site? That's what I just said. It, it implies it's being done on site in connection with the conversion of light to electricity. Utilized in connection with. To me, that implies being done on site, just like the client that was here before us that has mm -hmm. solar panels behind them all, and they want to put in two megawatts of batteries on their site. So I think this, this comes under one of those headings of the words that only lawyers can love because uh, it's like uh, reasonable screening and uh, in connection with. Um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Jim. Uh, it, I'm, not I'm not sure that this isn't in connection with uh, conversion. It, it's not directly converting, but, uh, you know, it, it, but I could, I could see it falling into the in connection with category, not wouldn't have to oh, be, it, but could. It, it, sir, the, that being said, it, it certainly, and I know this is, Intentions are uh, all hindsight, but it was not the intention of this bylaw to allow companies to come in and put battery installations in and draw electricity off of the grid to store to be sold later on. It was the intention that the storage come from electricity generated by solar panels on site. I was with you halfway through that. Gotcha. Go ahead. When we adopted this in 2012, I will agree it was not our intention to provide for battery storage, only because battery storage wasn't, I, I'm sure someone was thinking about it, but in 2012, now we're talking uh, 10 years ago, um, this was in its infancy if it existed at all. So it was not our intention to include a battery storage option, although we certainly did include the word storage in the bylaw. Um, so I'm with you to that point. Okay. Um, the saying it was our intention to only allow solar panels, I'm not sure. I think we, we, we meant to include provides a certain degree of flexibility here. You know, we had, we worded it with, uh, to cover, I'm going back to the definitions now. Uh, um, there's the solar ones. So maybe we need to accept that this is an acceptable use and then go back and change our wording for future projects. I tend to agree with Jim that this is an unacceptable use. So, you know. So when we did word solar energy system, we did all equipment, machinery, and structures utilized in connection with the conversion of light to electricity. This includes, but is not limited to, transmission, storage, collection, and supply equipment, substations, transformers, service, and access roads. So we were not, I don't think we were trying to limit this uh, at, that tightly, um, but I think we were, we're trying to leave some flexibility for what we knew was going to be a changing future, but um, we didn't know what direction that was going to go in. But I, but I do believe we meant that if you're going to put a storage system in, you were going to put a storage system in association with the solar panels on site. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to stick by my opinion on this one. That's how I inter That's how I am interpreting the definition, and I don't believe this is a permitted use right here. I mean, I'm, I'm with you against, there. First of all, 
I'm not against the battery usage. I'm not against battery storage. I think all that is great. I'm simply going by the word of the bylaw. I mean, I have solar on my house and I'm a, I'm a big fan of solar. I've always been a big fan of solar. I'm not, and I'm not against the battery storage idea, but by the bylaw, I don't see that it's permitted. And, you know, by the way, when, when this happens many, many times during conversation that people try to uh, wedge their concept of what we meant into their, their project. However, if you look at the first paragraph in our zoning regulations, nothing is allowed in the town of Hadley except as listed below, bling, 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 bling. So if this is not listed specifically, it is probably not allowed. Uh, so that's... Uh, you mean probably? Can we follow, you know, we're going to try to create a legal opinion here and maybe that's what we need. I would, I would prefer to take a vote on it and not ask for a legal opinion if, if uh, they want to challenge us and so be it. I think that the argument on their behalf is that if the organization that is funding this proposed construction makes their money from solar power, but does it elsewhere, then their argument would be in connection, not physically in connection, but in connection through the grid, they're putting the power in somewhere else. They're taking it out right here. That would be their argument. Yeah, and I don't now, think the Hadley bylaw cares what they do outside of Hadley. Well, I'm not thinking of our intent. I'm thinking of an attorney. And if we wanted to get into that kind of a, go to law school. <laughs> you, you are not an attorney, Mr. Dunn. So I'm, ju I'm, I'm just expressing my anything. opinion. I'm telling you what I think, if you will let me finish. <laughs> Mr. Dwyer has given me time and time again that I'm not an attorney. <laughs> but what if they turned around and sold this to, you know, coal electric, then would it be non-compliant? Because it's now being run by someone who doesn't produce solar. Well, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me, as you know, many solar fields, as soon as they're built, are sold. And... This is an asset that I'm sure, if it were in place, could be easily marketed. If they were to put this association with a solar site that had anywhere near five megawatts, it would be a no brainer for me. All right. This, these systems as a whole, you'll, I know that it, you're not seeing them yet, and I'm only speaking as the future of the technology and the way that renewable energy is going. These systems are what's the future of your quote unquote solar fields because right now we're implementing these projects on feeder lines that have a high concentration of solar being produced for the reason of absorbing it. And that's set forth through the DPU, through the Massachusetts um, DOER, uh, the whole regulations written around these projects absorbing solar energy during certain windows of time. That's how the clean peak energy standard is written. And that's how these projects work by absorbing solar energy as the find in the clean peak energy standard put out through the MDA. MDA water. And I'll just add to what Tom said, you know, this, this, this being the future, these sites are going to build resiliency back into the grid through the storage. And this, this affects your local infrastructure here. Um, there's a lot of sites being produced, out there, 150 megawatt sites um, in the middle of the transmission lines. Um, and those sites are really over, if you're looking at it from a picture of Hadley's here in this tiny little spot of Massachusetts, you got offshore wind being produced off of the offshore of, of Nantucket in two years. And they're putting these 100 megawatt battery sites along the transmission corridor to get the energy from Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard out to Western Mass, into New York, up into New Hampshire, up into Vermont. And from those bigger battery, they're 
we're going to be sending if we don't do these as developers national grid and ever source will be doing those themselves but it's in there and you can't have electrification of cars um everything that hey, we have electricity um you can't have more than 50 people on a feeder line charging a car at once you'll have a blowout so that's where these these storage facilities are coming into play and being implemented throughout the state of Massachusetts right now um, for that particular reason of supporting the grid and really creating the efficiency of utilizing your solar energy that you've already allowed to be built within the town. So I guess that's the last of my spiel there. I just wanted to make that point. So I just shared <clears throat> on the, uh, the chat an excerpt from chapter 40A, section six, and that being the uh, 40A, of course, being, the, uh, I'm sorry, 40A, section three, subjects which zoning may not regulate. And of course, 40A is the Zoning Act, and that is, you know, the bylaws flow from that. So um, we have this no zoning ordinance bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. So to some extent, this, this is the Dover Amendment for solar. And um, we have to... Uh, yeah, but but fact Bill, as Jim pointed out, this isn't solar that's going into into this battery storage. It's it, nuclear. It's, it's coal. It's natural gas. It's hydro. Um, we're not. Through, we're not through the definitions huh? of the standard, the Clean Peak Energy Standard, and that's why Massachusetts put this, like what Bill just shared. That's why they put this here because they know where the where the um renewable energy sector is going and they know that storage they knew when we were doing solar back in 2008 that they needed storage they just didn't know how to implement it so that's why they have this written the way that they have it and that eventually down the line this is all going to be implemented well you've seen that through the smart program with the solar which these guys before us which you guys were talking about some curbing or something um they've they're through the smart program that's a, that's through the smart program that's through the state doer that's through a um just like this Clean Peak Energy Standard. Um, so the, the state sets the, the precedence as far as like how you get to interpret things on the local level, um, especially the solar bylaws. And that's, that's, that's why you see towns put in storage into their bylaws. And that's why with towns that don't have energy storage within their bylaws currently, a, a lot of them that we've been working through with smart program we've done that already with them and gone through those motions to put that into their bylaws but um the ones that we go we do seek to go and leave through this the solar um energy systems uh part of the bylaws which have been successfully in the town. but, but so as, as bill pointed out our, our bylaw does allow for storage on a solar site in connection so to we're, we're not against that at all. We allow, we, you saw us just vote in favor of one at, behind the mall down there. So this is not the issue. So yeah, was uh, down before, was it not? before we, and I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll defer to Jim on this, but uh, the last part of it is except where necessary to protect public health, safety, or welfare. And, um, I know that there are other questions that have arisen. So could I ask that we maybe move on from this topic at this moment to talk about, oh, coolant. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, are, are we, or is that going to like, are we going to just have a conversation to not get anywhere, though, at the end of the day here? Um, um, another thing. To I want to develop the record here. Um, okay. You know, if, if if um, I don't want to see this be decided on a on one procedural level, we'll call it a motion for summary judgment, and then have a court tell us to take another look at it. Um, I would like to hear your full presentation, 
and uh, you know, we're, we're hung up on one thing here, but. Good point. Yes, uh, I agree. I've, I've presented everything that I've came to present already. I, I'm open to questions. Okay. What, what, what are your, what, how was your cooling? Are you cooling these batteries? These are liquid cooled batteries as yes. Uh, as we discussed a little bit in December, um, there were some concerns around the ethylene, which I'm addressing. Um, so that's all in the works as far as that goes. There won't be ethylene glycol being used in the system. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. I've made some headway with the manufacturer on uh, going the propylene route. So we're looking pretty good right there. So what is your cooling medium on this? Is that liquid? It's a liquid cooled. And what is the medium being? How is, what is the medium? It will be propylene. Propylene glycol? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Propylene glycol is, I don't want to say it's non, totally non-toxic, but it's, it's, it's at least non-toxic to, for the most part. I mean, you were to drink a gallon of the stuff, you'd probably be pretty sick, but it won't kill you. You drink a gallon of ethylene, you'd be laying feet up. Okay. Okay, so the cooling system is... Um, I mean, noise-wise, you're quite away from many houses. Is that correct? Yeah, and the, really, the only things making noise here are the condensers uh, for the cooling system. It's not nearly as much noise as an air unit. Um, air units are typically at 80, 86 decibel, standing within a meter, seven anywhere seventy-five to eighty-five. Uh, these are roughly 50, 55 um, at a meter. And as you go well from there, it diminishes a current equation. So about a hundred feet, you really can't hear these things at all. Because that goes for solar stuff too. My, my, Mr. Spanky, but you're okay with the uh, safety fire systems on this? Yes, we reviewed all that and they will all incorporate the um, suppression system we talked about for the previous. Okay. All right. So I had one call from someone who was just concerned about the <clears throat> was concerned about the potential impact on the aquifer, and he was also concerned about uh, and he's probably your nearest neighbor the um, worst possible scenario. So am I understanding that these things don't go boom? No, you don't see an explosion really with these. Um, uh, and like the chief had mentioned earlier, um, there, there were cases back some years ago in Arizona about the fire department opening up the door. Um, that's why the industry moved away from habitable containers. They moved to non-habitable containers, only accessed from one, up, one side these days as well with these liquid cooled systems. Um, and really, you don't have that buildup um, of the gases involved when it's such a tight um, container. You don't have you don't have that door opening. The the protocol is that something wants to catch on fire, um, like Keith had said earlier, that virtually doesn't get to that point um, if you have the scan system running operating correctly. Um, but if it was to catch fire, it's a thermal runaway, so it's a slow propagation of heat. It's not an explosion. Um, there's nothing in there that would create an explosion without an introduction of more oxygen um, or something of that nature. Uh, so that's kind of what happened in pr prior exploding batteries um, fires. So the protocol here is to surround and drown, really. I mean, I, we leave it up to the fire department, obviously, um, but speaking of the general uh, term, um, typically you would attack the uh, surrounding areas and not necessarily drench a uh, unit itself unless deemed absolutely necessary or the fire department was more comfortable approaching it that way. But um, where our energy sort um, our consultants, ESRG um, out of Ohio, uh, recommend against a physical approach of um, putting water directly on the system at first until otherwise um, the opinion across the other way, I guess. What, what? Better from um, our consultants at, over at ESRG that uh, goes over the water runoff um, from a fire. So these guys do, they, these guys have done over 200 small and large scale battery fire testing uh, with water runoff samples, mandatory for them in order to dispose of. 
Um, and they provided me with a letter for you guys. I had never got a chance to get over you. I was on vacation this weekend. So I wasn't able to get it over, but I have it for you. Uh, I'll send it to Bill so you guys can look at it. Um, it does say that it's no more detriment than a regular structure fire. Um, they've got the testing to back that up and they're working with the large national energy company right now to do all those data sources and they continue to do so. Um, but I do have a letter for you though. I just wanted to mention that. So these batteries are, are stored in the container, right? Correct. The container is what, steel, concrete? Steel. Steel, so it would look like a container of a trailer or something? It would look pretty similar to the guys prior to us. Okay. Yeah. So how much liquid coolant is in the system? Uh, about uh, roughly 75 gallons a container. And that runs through all the modules to keep the batteries operating at an optimal temperature. You have difficulties and a lot of, a lot of your fires kind of circulate around the ability to not cool your batteries. So with an air system, it's very ineffective to be touching an area of the box. Um, so this liquid cooled stuff, this liquid cooled system is really the most efficient way to cool these batteries and ever been to alleviate any concerns of thermal runaway. So this technology also with the lithium iron phosphate, they don't go into thermal runaway till around 248 degrees uh, versus your, your regular metal halide battery or your heavy metal battery batteries, like your uh, cobalt batteries, your lithium iron, with the co lithium ion with the cobalt, they have a much lower um, thermal runaway. Um, so you're at right around 200 degrees when these things start to catch and go into thermal runaway. So there's a lot of safety aspects around this whole system and the way that it's being built. It's essentially just like a Tesla system. This is this happens to be SunGrow who manufactures it. Is each container has its own cooling system or are they common to one? No, each, each container is its own self-contained cooling system. Okay. So it, we had previously required Nexamp to put curbing around the, um, the pads so that if the coolant leaked, okay, yeah. it would be contained. I would be on board um, with that as well. So that would be... I would be in favor of that. Um, that, that makes sense for the containment of the fluid. Okay. If there was ever a leak. Does each container normally sit on a concrete pad? Yes. Okay. So I'm just thinking now if the, but you say you have, have some uh, material on the fact that if. I do, yeah. So I do have like water runoff, um, a, a water runoff letter from ESRG for the fire aspect of it um, and for the quality of water that gets put back into the ground. It gets so I'm, I'm just visualizing a circumstance where the, the battery overheats because the coolant has ruptured for some reason. Yeah, so, so you now have when, 75 gallons of coolant contained by your curb, and then the fire department comes and dumps water in. Yeah, what happens yeah. to the coolant? The, that system would be shut down as soon as it got a temperature reading higher than the threshold that's set. Um, so the, the system is, is pulls hundreds of data sets every second. Um, and you have the ability throughout the system to trip fuses in this sense. So if that temperature gets above a certain threshold that it, it pretty much knows that that coolant system has failed. So it shuts that system, that content, that container off. It can go down to the single rack level and shut off a single rack. If it knew that the leak was it could almost think for itself, the system. Yes. So I'm just trying to think through what would happen, though, if you, if you have the propylene glycol and water introduced. Let's say the reason the battery goes hot is because the coolant has leaked for some odd reason. So now you have water and coolant together. Does that change the calculus of what's being spread on the ground? Not in what they found. With, with the fire and the, the coolant being there, it's it's going to be dissipated through the heat of the fire. These things burn at like 600 degrees. 
So you, you'd be shutting down when you, you, you you'd have readings that t- were telling you you were facing a coolant failure. So you, you would know, be we, shutting down. You'd be trying to shut down the battery at that point anyway. It, it, would, it would trip it itself before it even called anybody. It would shut down itself. The system would. If, reading, if, it's, if it read a cell battery going in, going hot, it would, it would trip a fuse and it would shut that rack down. Yeah. And in this case, it would shut every rack down consecutively along the way. I'll try to answer your question for you, Bill. You got a coolant that leaks, battery gets hot, fire department comes along and pours water into the system and it overflows the curbing. And now you have propylene glycol and water leaking into the ground. That's my reason for the propylene glycol. Mm -hmm. Propylene glycol is the same kind of antifreeze that is used in a solar system. If it gets into your water system, if your heat exchanger in your tank leaks the glycol and it gets into your drinking water, it's going to taste horrible. No doubt about it. But it's not going to kill you and it's not necessarily going to pollute anything unless you lose, I want to say, thousands and thousands of gallons of propylene glycol. 75 gallons going into the ground is going to be not a good thing, but it's not going to be a hazardous thing. Is that basically a real overstatement, Tom? I wouldn't agree with you there. Yeah. One of the big things about ethylene glycol and your radiator, it's a separate topic. For some reason, when ethylene glycol or antifreeze in your original car, if you ever accidentally tasted it, it's sweet. And there is a, unfortunate, a lot of instances of very young children thinking that it's good and getting sick and some of them very dying from it. And they've been after the Automobile, I mean, the uh, antifreeze manufacturers for years to change the, somehow change the formulation so that it tastes bitter and not sweet. I don't know if that's ever been done. So, so how high should the curb be? Was that Joe? Yeah. How high should the curb be? Uh, you know, if we're looking to contain the glycol plus the water. Yeah, the, the, the curbing will contain probably 99% of the issues that ever arise or some very high percentage. But there may be an occasional oops where water is needed. The fire department comes along, be it our place or someplace else and pours water into it and it gets into the ground. If you use an propylene glycol, it's not going to be a terrible issue okay so i think if we just say that the curbing is must be uh, a curbing adequate to control or adequate to contain right um they can do the math uh i don't want to tell it tell them it has to be six inches or 18 inches um standard, has to be standard, standard pill spill containment is 110 percent of the capacity and you know, that, that's a lot. And, um, you know, they, you, you, you can't design for somebody coming along and pouring hundreds and hundreds of gallons on a system that holds 75. It might happen, but it's a di- different issue. So. so that I'm glad we went through that because that addresses a number of concerns that I've been hearing. Um, but I do have, so it seems we have two issues. Um, one, um, is sort of the, uh, we'll call it the jurisdictional issue. Um, are batteries eligible? And the second one, um, Tom, I thought I heard you say that you're still designing the propylene system. 
Uh, not designing. It's the same system. It's just going through the motions with the manufacturers. They just have to get it all um, a okay really, because it's they run their tests with the ethylene. So they're so, the going through uh, those motions. With all of those hundreds of pages of documents that you presented us with, mm -hmm. has that been, has the change in coolant been factored into those in any way? It, it has, well, no, you don't have like a data sheet for it or anything. I'm still like, we just started talking about this last month and I'm talking to people in China about trying to get this stuff implemented. So it's taking some time and it can certainly be a condition upon that we can't use ethylene glycol, which is totally fine with me. I'm doing my best to work with the manufacturer right now and way uh, um, to get this moving along. A, 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 a bit of information on that, Mr. Dwyer. A propylene glycol system is not as efficient at cooling as a same capacity ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is a more efficient coolant. So the system may have to go slightly larger. Okay, and, like, that's that's what they're looking at is like compressor wise. Okay. To avoid a lot of legal issues here, I recommend I request that we ask town council if this is a permitted use in our system based on our bylaw. Because if we turn this down and get sued or we approve it and get sued, I don't want to go through that. I mean, right now, he, we don't have the votes to approve this. And I don't want to go through a nasty legal battle. I'd like to avoid that. I'd like to get town council opinion if this is a permitted use or not. Jim, uh, in light of that, uh, is there any way that we could clarify the uh, for these batteries to be there by tweaking our zoning bylaws at the annual town meeting? Absolutely. Maybe but that, we. Can... But, but but that's five months away. Well. Well, I would like to get the opinion now, and if they if it's if they say it's an approved use then we give this system the approval. If they say it's not a permitted use, then we go, and in any case, we go to town meeting and make it more clear. But I would like to, i like to get, this guy, this, this gentleman doesn't want to wait five months um, if he can get approval in a month from now. I'm more than willing to work uh, with you guys on a five, uh, eventually too, if you ever need it. Yeah. You know. Several other towns. Yeah, and if I'm wrong, I fully admit it's a permitted use, but if it is not a permitted use, we need to address that because, like I said, I'm not against the battery storage. I'm, I, I think solar is a great thing, and I certainly see the need for storing electricity for the off hours because people are going, I mean, wind is hit or miss 24 hours a day, whereas solar is at least reliable most of the time, at least during the day to daylight hours, but you got to do something for non-daylight. I think we ought to still keep the, the two-track system before us. Let's say all of a sudden uh, the town council says, it's not perfectly clear. It's got to be tweaked uh, at a town meeting. So perhaps we should have that available at a town meeting and we can always pull it. Uh, but that's just... That's yeah, kind so of. The, I, I agree. We we should we should get this on a warrant for the for the town meeting in May, and make it clear one way or the other. In the meantime, if we could ask town council about this and get a decision in, you know, a month okay. or so. Uh, so like a two tier approach. All right. If if town town council says that it's a permitted use, does that mean anybody can put one of these things in? Until you change your in the in the appropriate zones, yes. Okay. So we're not going to have to worry about a trailer park. We're going to have to worry about battery parks. <laughs> You'd have to get it cleared with every source, and it's becoming very costly. Again, again we, we we can tweak our bylaw to regulate that a little bit. I think we might want to. Um, Are you putting one of these in Amherst and North Amherst, by the way? I know I'm not in Amherst, no. And so, somebody's putting one in up there. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're seeing it a lot now. Uh, they're going in everywhere. The big sites, too, are starting to come into play. Just out of curiosity, how, how large do they make these bat a single battery capac capacity, or is, or is it just a matter of multiple banks of them? So these banks are the big, the, like this system here, I don't want to like toot our own horn, but this is the most advanced system as far as flexibility for development wise in order to like grow your site. So this, this particular design and the way that it's made and the cooling and the way that it connects to the um, power control modules, uh, like the transformers and stuff. So these can build out in a block and save 60% of the land that you would with a normal HVAC system. So that's, that's, these systems are coming into play and you can build them up to 300, 400 megawatts. They've got a 300 megawatt plant up in California, 300 megawatts down in Texas. Uh, there's actually going to be 175 megawatt, I believe, down in Carver, Massachusetts. Uh, that's going in now. Um, there'll be a battery bank on Martha's Vineyard. There's battery banks coming all the way up. Follow 495, essentially, all the way up. For This is all offshore wind stuff, and they're going to make all these... Uh, peaker plants like Mystic and um, the other ones along the south coast, they're all they're, um, disassembling those plants and they're putting batteries in them. So they're all going to be battery peaker plants versus fossil fuel peaker plants. Okay. Right. Yeah, I would recommend that we uh, continue it for a month because um, it has been slow getting feedback from town council. Okay. I think we have a very narrow question here. Um, Great. Hmm? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we can put this into one sentence. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just to clarify. So is the only open item right now this use question? Because Tom spoke to the, the cooling. So I think we're okay with a condition that it be uh i'm sorry which one is the ethanol propylene. Like all? Propylene. Propylene. propylene okay thank you propylene. so we are okay with the condition that it be a propylene glycol system and once we have that updated information we can provide it to the board for review so yes. is there any for is, is that Okay, or is there any further discussion required on that item? I, I was the one that made the big deal about the propylene versus the ethylene. I'm an engineer. So unfortunately, you're, we're, we're talking apples and apples between you and me, good, bad, or otherwise. Okay. However, I'm good with the propylene system. Capacity-wise, yeah, it may go to 80 gallons. It may be a bigger compressor, but those are, those are minutia points. Those are irrelevant. Agreed. Okay. The, the remaining question is, is this permitted or not by our zone bylaw? Okay, great. <clears throat> so I think if that's the case, can we just on the off chance, can we continue to two weeks out just in case we do get a confirmation back sooner? Because I agree, it's a very narrow question. I know sometimes I, it takes... So I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I, I've worked with town council for over 30 years. And he doesn't just play one on TV. <laughs> there is a reason why I suggested a month. Fair enough. Uh, you, you, you've got a smattering of expertise on this board that people don't realize you've got. So we've got so, finance, we've got architects, we've got lawyers and engineers and doctors. So, so it's I, hard I, to pull a wool over all of our eyes. I will say I do have a reservation in that um, I, I'm, I'm kind of feeling, Tom, like you, you don't have a complete application because you haven't, there, there's a piece you're still working on. And I, I understand what Jim is saying about, well, as long as we say it's the right kind of system, how you actually put it together, I'm, I'm, I'm digesting that. As an engineer, he doesn't think that the details are that big. I'm looking at it sort of from the big picture of, you didn't file a complete applica application, but maybe okay. it's just that you left out one page. Uh, so. Well, it's that we're changing it. And so the, the, the application has the ethylene and we're changing it properly. And so it's something that I have to work okay. on, on a condition of it. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah, it's going to change design, but I understand also in the big picture where you are. The design of, state, I, just to that point, though, the design remains the same. It's just the sizing of the tubing is what they're really looking at is how much flow they have to have. So nothing changes in the container except for maybe a hose size uh, the type of fluid going into it. So it's just something that they have to test on site uh, in order to ship it out of the country to us. Okay. And what's changing is in response to our request. So. Yeah, and again, um, we can work with you on that condition. Again, our intent would be to provide whatever updated documentation we need. We just want to um, keep the process moving as best we can. You mentioned the system down on the Cape from the wind. Yes. Are, are, are those batteries strictly storing electricity generated by offshore wind or is it taking stuff from the grid too? Depends on how you look at it. They're pulling them off the line. So yeah, in my opinion, they're pulling it from the wind, but they're pulling it off of the main transmission line in order to get it there. So it's all, it's all in retrospect. This is how we're working these systems as well. You can't really put this stuff next to the sites that are already existing because you have landowner issues. You have already pre-existing sites built and permitted. Yeah. Started to go back to revise plans and revise sites that are already built to the max. Um, so that's why you see the standalone system, and that's why Massachusetts enables Clean Peak standard that regulates this stuff and how it's uh, controlled through the state EPU. Does someone track the numbers of uh, you know how many kilowatts go in of wind and how many kilowatts go into the grid of solar and how many go in of that is being implemented now. Uh, there is no way to track that right now, really. I mean, there is on a, on a development side of things. The personal, prop, the personal owner of the project knows how much is going in and how much is going out. But it's not something that the um, power source would really have an idea of um, as far as being able to look at it remotely and have that asset available. Um, so there, there are the state of Massachusetts, and the BPU and the DOER, are making all the EDCs implement what they call a derm system so that they can track this stuff um, remotely. And realistically, it would be that the solar is on and once the solar goes off, it would tell the batteries to come on. Um, it's what they call a smart grid. Um, Unitil up north a little bit um, has done it in New Hampshire. Um, I live in Sterling and that's what we do as well. We have a battery bank with our substation and it's a smart grid system. Um, so it turns on and off on its own. Okay. Is there any way to tell, given the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent on green energy, whether it's had any effect on any anything in, ter in terms of climate change or global warming? Or that I don't. Uh, I don't. I'm not really too up on that as far as the um, data on that. So oh, I'll uh, I'll respond to that question as a fellow human being, not as a professional engineer. I happened to read an article the other day, and I just wasn't even aware of this, um, but I feel like it said like 50% of the United States power came from solar or is projected to come through solar in the next year. I didn't realize we were that far along. 50? Really? Five 50? zero, yeah. Wow, yeah. I, I had no idea it was anywhere near that. Yeah, and like, I, again- Where did you read that, Mother Jones? <laughs> yeah, it was WWW, I, I don't- <laughs> I, I took myself because I should have saved it. But, and it, it was a pretty substantial, I want to say it was a pie chart. And a good chunk of that pie chart was wind, too. Kevin, like, you got you to start yeah. smoking that stuff before you come to meetings. <laughs> wind, wind, the wind energy off of Martha's Vineyard, just for example, the first two wind projects is 1,400 megawatts worth of power. Yeah, they're big. There's a total of six going on. Wow. Six lease areas. And there's a ton of wind out west, too. So we don't have a t nearly as much wind in the northeast, obviously, yeah. as they do you, out west. You could, I, 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 I've, I've gone fishing in South Texas, uh, you, you Gulf of Mexico down. down there, and there's wind farms out of the kazoo along the Gulf down there because the yeah. wind constantly blows off the Gulf. It yeah. never stops. Dr drive down through Virginia and into Tennessee and stuff. When there's some areas there in the mountains in the, in the uh, Shenandoahs, Holy smokes, it looks like there's literally a couple hundred windmills. Yeah. Ridge. 
Okay, I'll make a motion to continue this to February 15th. Second. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. See you on the 15th, gentlemen. Thank you guys are good guys you trying time. to do God's work. Thank Have you. Have a good evening. That was a long one. Mr. Comey, are you asleep? <laughs> I was enjoying the conversation that the board was having. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always fun to go through, you know, these types of conversations when you're looking at a zoning bylaw and, and reviewing the intent by which you approved it. Um, so obviously the board is very serious about administering the bylaw the way that they sought, you know, that they were thinking about it. And, and there were lots of good comments and commentary regarding that, um, you know, that discourse. So I always enjoy that when boards are starting to look at their bylaw and then identifying the fact that they need to address a bylaw amendment at some point. Well, what do you think, Ken? Oh, well. I mean, it, <laughs> I don't want to, no, don't, don't answer that. Don't point not, he's, <laughs> he's not oh, paid he, We pay him the big bucks. Let him tell he's us. He's not paid <laughs> enough to have an opinion, Mike. <laughs> kid, kid, want to, kid want to stay friendly with us. Yeah. <laughs> when I see you in person, maybe after yeah. a meeting when we're not. Okay. Yeah. But you know, you've got three members on this board that have been there forever right. and probably had a part in creating most of the bylaws that are on the books. So we're very well aware of what our, we think what our intent was. And even we will disagree in our intent because, because, and right. you know, we, we, we wanted to say this and like Mr. Dwyer says, and he's fully right. When this bylaw was passed 10 years ago, batteries were in its infancy. And the idea of having a five megawatt battery store electricity was so ridiculously expensive that it wasn't even realistic. Well, guess what? 10 years later, it's more than realistic. It's, 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 it's actually economical. Right. And so these are things that, you know, if it, if it isn't permitted, even if it is, we need to make it more clear and change the bylaw appropriately so that in the future, we don't have to argue about these things. I, the example I use is the, the first hard drive computer uh, I had had a 20 megabyte hard drive, which ran all of the applications, uh, the system, and um, stored all my documents. Um, last week, I, I created a 20 megabyte PDF. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you take pictures nowadays with your, if you've got a high end digital camera. One picture can be 30 and 40 megabytes. I, right. I, had, I agree with Bill. I had the same thing with my first computer. And I now have single pictures that are way more than my computer could be. I mean, back then, if you had a, a RAM of probably one or two megabytes, you had a big, big RAM. Now you've got RAMs that are almost, you know, a gigabyte, and it's not big enough. <laughs> so anyways. We, di we digress. Um, well, yeah, I mean, and and it, it you definitely had a lot of great conversations and ran the gamut of various things the planning board would be talking about. So it's always interesting to see what communities are doing. Um, so I think with regards to the, the last conversation we had last month, um, we were taking a look at just the administration of how your decisions are written um, and looking at ways to incorporate existing documents that Bill as the, the clerk when he, um, you know, refines a decision and utilizes findings and um, some of the, and, and more template, but also incorporating conditions that you place upon the approval, um, creating some, you know, consistent document. And so what I shared with the board was um, a for, like a, a template that I prepared um, that I use in other communities um, when, I, when I'm tasked with helping them prepare a decision. Um, understanding that the board, you know, does to, to some extent include procedural histories um, and to some extent um, includes the findings as appropriate based on your site plan, plan approval, um, app, um, 
criteria and criteria in other parts of the bylaw. Um, so what I presented to the board, and I'm just gonna quickly um, share my screen based on what I'm talking through is um, something that possibly could be used. I, I know that um, Bill would probably be the one that um, populates this, understanding that there are, it's a template that he would take from the application and or um, the public notice, um, include any peer review services as part of what could be found in the procedural history, and then the findings where you can be as descriptive as you want, um, just to, as Bill had suggested during that public hearing, to create the context for the case um, and for the application. Um, for whatever, you know, for if you decide to deny, if you decide to approve, uh, approve with conditions. Um, so this is a template based on your current sections of the bylaw. You have 8.7.1.1, which is one of the criteria and it goes all the way down to 8.7.1.6. Um, you know, the, in looking at some of the, the documents that Bill shared, um, there is the, the coordination with the Conservation Commission, um, how you include um, reference to any action by the Conservation Commission, my suggestion, especially if it's like a parallel, a parallel application, um, is to maybe coordinate any um, order of conditions by listing the actual DEP number that's issued um, or any negative determination and then also citing the date that that determination was made. Um, you have cannabis. So you have a cannabis bylaw and you have particular criteria that you would need to, that the board would need to find um, when they create their decision or when they make their decision. Um, and so this is taking directly from your bylaw and you'll see that in yellow. And then the, the, the listing of the decision um, and your vote and then the conditions. And so what I included here are um, the conditions that there were some conditions that I listed within the context of the section um, that Bill had, had used in um, one of the examples. But what I'd like, or what I recommend to the board is that you list the title, the plans um, that are approved. I think that was a comment that I remember hearing at the last meeting was that sometimes you get a set of plans and you either go through um, this very public permitting process and then plans are weird by the time you know, it gets to building, um, the building review. Um, so ensuring that you have a set of plans that are approved, um, that, you know, it is tedious in that you list all the sheets, you list all the dates, but as, as um, thorough as you can be with your decision, that, you know, eliminates a lot of the question for the, um, for the one that gets uh, the project approved. Um, and also providing the ability, and this is an example from the, uh, the, the template that I, was, that I use, is to use um, any peer review, outstanding peer review questions um, or comments that if the board would be deciding to act that day um, and be able to um, turn around that decision, that if there happens to be any additional comments that that would be addressed and that's, that's a, um, a condition of approval. Um, and then a lot of this also, um, and then listing the waivers. I know that the board issues waivers from time to time um, with regards to sections of the bylaw. Um, and then there's, these are general, more general conditions about if there are material changes to the site plan or special permit that they need to come back to the board, that's, that's you know, and, and that if there are deviations that there will be a cease and desist order from the zoning enforcement officer. Um, in addition to um, however the board would decide how long a permit should last, um, usually it's two years. Um, 
and that the members or agents of the planning board um, shall have the right to enter um, the site if there happens to be a contentious item. Again, and these are all conditions that you can eliminate um, if you don't want them to be standard. Um, but what I would suggest is um, if there are standards, um, and I will say that this has been used in multiple site plan approvals where the applicant is prepared that these are um, conditions of approval for a board to reach. Um, and they are aware that they need to abide by them and that you know they will be followed up and enforced. Um, a big item that I've realized in my time and working with boards is that um, the planning board has every right to revoke or through a special, uh, through a public hearing um, of an application that has just gone off the rails. So if the planning board wants to seek amending conditions or revoking or rescinding that approval that um, you do have within your bylaw too, um, under section six, that there is material non-compliance of that special permit or the site plan approval and that you can go through a public process by you know, eliminating conditions and or addressing um, the issues with the permit. And then you know, um, here's a comment about what you may want to do if you have something like accessory apartments. Um, you, know, you may have specific uh, conditions that you've used before for those, um, like, uh, I think one of the ones I recall from your from one of the decisions that you wrote was the um, the non trans uh, it, may, it may have been non transference but that there needed to be a certain amount of parking spots and you know a, a kitchen unit um, per unit um, but those were listed as one of the conditions. Oh yeah, these these down here. Um, so that's more of like a header where you would use. These, part these particular conditions there um, for accessory apartments. And then incorporating some of the other, the, the other comments that um, Bill had put in previous decisions um, with the um, requirement that if there are any other permits that need to be collected, that they have that, um, that they go through those process processes. Um, and then in yellow here, I, you know, have some typical pre-construction, construction and post-construction conditions that you may or may want to, you know, consider. Um, but those are, you know, typical um, with regards to how a constru the construction site should be at the end of the day, uh, housekeeping um, during construction, and then what happens after construction um, you know, plans that get to the board, um, final plans as built, ensuring that the certificate of approval from the building inspector um, gets, um, uh, it, it's, it's only um, completed when this, this, and this are um, provided to the board. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if the, this is a consideration that one of the boards that I worked with, if there had, it, and this was a, a particular to a solar project, um, they wanted that certificate of, of approval and they were willing to provide um, an upfront um, monetary surety um, to get that approval. And we went through that process. Um, but so those are some typical kind of decisions. I don't know if that's too much. I don't know if um, the look doesn't look right to you, but um, my suggestion, or my my suggestion, is to um, you know, having heard your comments from the last meeting, maybe um, look to creating a consistent document um, and figuring out how to, yeah, how to I, start I, doing that. I, I think you're right. I think this is something that <clears throat> this is sort of what I'm aspiring to. Um, and probably a lot of the verbiage is something that only matters doesn't matter as much to everyone else. Um, what I was hoping to accomplish was to get something like an insurance policy 
where you have your uh, you know two or three pages of declarations, and then the second part of it is the boilerplate. And yeah, I'm not asking you to edit this or anything, but uh, just mechanically, how would we go about, um, at, at present, when we approve something, I end up reading off the whole decision, um, including all of the standard boilerplate conditions. And I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way to how, how can we set it up so that I don't have to read 38 conditions, 38 conditions when 27 of them are unchanged? Well, I think um, what could happen and, um, you know, what I've done in when I was working as a conservation agent for, you know, when when the Conservation Commission provided their um, order of conditions, they used the standard or the standard conditions that came from the state. And they would in their declaration, say approval in, you know, with the, the standard conditions um, that are provided by the state and then specific conditions and would list those specific conditions. And I think you may do that already when you talk through um, specific site conditions, some of the conditions you were talking about this evening uh, for the solar projects. Um, but I think what you, the, the board could probably do is provide um, a list of standard conditions. Um, and in the action, you know, if the board were to look at uh, approving with conditions, approve, um, with standard conditions and X, Y, and Z, if there are any site-specific um, conditions. I think you can place those conditions within the documents of the planning board, um, maybe future, in the future incorporated within um, our rules and regulations. The thing is, they're, this, I think if you look at it, you know, decisions are separate from what would be existing in your bylaws. It's not something that you would adopt, but I think you could make it as a policy that you are probably going to typically be approving these standard conditions. I think if they may exist in the rules and regulations that these are the typical conditions of a site plan approval, I think that's appropriate. Um, I also have seen boards just just say that we have a set of standard conditions that are posted on the website that we are adopting for this approval, but here are very specific conditions regarding this particular use or this particular construction. Um, so so we I can think do it that, by, we can do it by a vote. You know, we can, <clears throat> let's say we uh, first meeting after the election, we reorganize the board. That's a standard agenda item. Sure. And theoretically, at the same meeting, we could vote to uh, adopt uh, standard conditions for the next period, or you know, July one, adopt standard conditions for the next fiscal year. I think that's that's enough, and then we print them out and attach them to the decision. Yeah, I think that's very appropriate, and I think that that is enough. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think that you know, if you want to review these and they need to be refined in any way. Um, the thing with this too, is I think typically this would be found elsewhere within your regulations, um, and maybe even the building code, um, to a certain extent, but no, I think Bill, your, your, um, thought of adopting these as standard conditions for all approvals makes sense. And then just posting it, um, somewhere, um, okay. And one, one thing that uh, caught my attention, uh, that board members are allowed to go on site. Uh, this, this suggests that you need to have the permission. One member being kind of a lone ranger and, and going on to a site and making a lot of noise. We've had a situation like this with our conservation commission and... Uh, well, we have the zoning enforcement officer, but 
it leads to some uncomfortableness because all members of the board may not agree with this particular. Sure. Yeah, I mean that, and that that may be a condition that you just decide to you know strike, but or a suggest you know again these are suggestions. So um, I've seen it where the applicant was okay with if there happened to be a question about the site that with proper notification and that they the planning board has the right to ask we'd like to you know be oh, okay. uh, members of the board not is somebody going in as a lone ranger right yeah no definitely there would be some sort of reach out or outreach to That's, the yeah I'm, I'm fine with that and the other thing is to uh we've got away from posting a bond an assurance bond uh Traditionally, we had that. Uh, do many towns still use that bond as a club over the uh, the contractor's head to make sure they'll comply with all the rules and regulations, or not? Um, I've seen them mostly in subdivision, but I haven't really been through a subdivision process in a very long time in in Massachusetts. Probably that was one one of my first actions when I was. Um, as uh, working as a town planner, but um, it, it's not typical. Um, they use it because there happen to be discussion when you're talking about certificates of approval, specifically for solar. Um, and that was specific to solar. So that was a suggestion based on, you know, an experience that I had with a board on solar yeah. and, and the applicant was- That's the solar, but okay. Yeah. So the, the, there's a little history behind that too. At one point, uh, our building, our then building inspector, took the position that if work was done pursuant to the building code, he could not withhold a certificate of occupancy, even if the conditions of site plan approval had not been satisfied. And I believe some years back, like five to 10 years back, the building code was changed to some degree to allow the building inspector also wearing his or hat to withhold um, a CO if uh, zoning conditions had not been satisfied. Tom, is that your understanding of the current state of the law? It's a tough call. It's like permits and that sign off uh, conservation and things like that really could be challenged. Um, you know, it, it kind of hold it over their head, especially issuing the permit or the CO is a big thing. But I've been told, you know, if the um, contractor homeowner wanted to challenge it, it wouldn't hold up us holding it up in that case. Don't like a lot of people to know that, but, um, you know, you, you, you try to get, you know, what you want accomplished before it goes that far. Right. <clears throat> But if we told someone to put in a detention pond as part of their site plan approval and they just didn't do it, what, what recourse do we have? What can you do if someone has failed to satisfy the requirements of the um, site plan approval? Hold it up. I don't know legally if it, it, you know, how far that would go. I mean, because it, it wouldn't it go back to the developer itself, you know, not the person on the lot and was the lot released. And with all the variables, it's a, it's a tough question. Well, I would it, hold it up to work together as long as I could, but yeah. You know, so if someone is putting up a building, uh, let's let's pick on Target. Uh, they they want to re renovate the building. They come to us. They get a sign off from a waiver of site plan approval or they get a new site plan approval and then they put up something different. Uh, doors and windows in different places, uh, different appearance than what was approved, but built to code compliance. Where do we go with something like that? Cease and desist. <clears throat> yes, for sure. I, I mean, in that case, that should hold up. It's your determination. You know, that's what was um, 
specified and and what should have been done. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the other thing, Ken, you said to incorporate the order of conditions that the Conservation Commission throws out, but oftentimes that's delayed. So uh, well, you, I, you, we say other boards, if and as required, or Bill says that. Yeah, and I think if you look at the, you know, Bill has used that or the board has used that um, in previous decisions. Where you say where you say that they need to get the permits from the other authorities, um, you know that was just a case of whether or not the timing, you know, and you could incorporate conditions and reference to those order of conditions or reference to any discussion that was happening or any approvals by the conservation commission, just to ensure that there is, you know, some so, coordination. A prior chair of the conservation commission took the view that. The Conservation Commission was supposed to be the last stop on the development merry-go-round. And they would uh, not weigh in until you had your site plan approval, you had all your variances. But as a practical matter, that left you in a situation where you could have to go back and redo everything else. So um, currently, the Conservation Commission is not advocating for that they're working we're all sort of working together here and um, trying to keep things moving on parallel tracks yeah and i and i think that that's important you know and obviously you want to make it make the process efficient um you know and you don't want as a board to go back after you've approved something because um some the, the conservation commission has decided that there was um, you know some specific design standard that was not meeting the intent of the the your wetlands bylaw or the the WPA. Um, but that too, I think, if the board utilizes peer review or the conservation utilizes peer review, there is just that efficiency that happens hopefully in town government with you know either liaison or you know that there, that discussion is happening um and sometimes that happens with some a land use person i know the board was discussing this land use staff person that may you know balance their time between multiple boards or provide administrative support to those boards but would be knowing of what was happening in each of those boards ken you've been on the conservation commission our conservation commission does not send out notification to a butters when something is being done. Uh, but we have to for a special permit, Zoning Board of Appeal does. Uh, do they have exemption or what? Um, I think it uh, depends on the project. So if it's an order of conditions, yes. But if it's a, uh, a determination, um, like a uh, what I, an RDA, I forgot what it's called. Um, I haven't been an agent in a while, but um, if it's an RDA, which is another type of permit, no. Um, it, re it requires a, a notification in the newspaper, but not in a butter notification. But a, an order of conditions or going through that notice of intent process, yes, that needs to go to a butters. That's the rec uh, request for determination, determination of applicability. Of applicability. Yeah. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you all for educating me tonight. Yeah. We, we learn something at every meeting, even for those that have been on here forever. <laughs> That's right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I don't think those guys expected to hear goat milk tonight. So. Well, I thought that was a great <laughs> analogy. I, mean, <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> He seemed to have an issue with that one, but I like I like your uh, metaphor on that one. That was good. Yeah, right. yeah might might be we could bring it more local about bringing milk from the Cook Farm and the West Farm and there the you go, yeah. Farm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> or the chocolate milk from brown cows, right? Yeah. But you know, if somebody does have a contaminates that whole load, the whole load goes. Into yeah. 
The whole load goes to be uh, to the Hadley battery. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like the battery idea. I like the, you know, getting us on alternative energy. We just have to parse out the details and it has to be, it has to be safe and, and right. And, yeah. I just wanted to say on that is um, I hesitated to give an interpretation on the zoning on that. I pulled up the emails and I, we must have between phone calls, at least over a dozen emails and calls. And when I gave them the interpretation, it clearly stated it was your, you know, it had to go in front of planning and you were the decision on it. Oh. So the more I look back, I wonder if they've run into this before mm. that it was questioned like that. So it's going to be interesting. I see both sides now. I, I, it's a good question. The way we're asking it, what council says, yeah. I, I think they've run into it. Well, we'll find out, you know, get get an opinion. And because, you know, almost we, we can, we can, we, we, we talked about it enough. We'll see. All right. Let's let uh, Ken go to bed. So I'll make a motion to approve the PVPC bill. Oh, yes. I, I, I was going to say, bring it up. I got an invoice from PVPC for $3,212.62 for the last quarter of the year. I second the motion. Motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, um, I also sent to the board the an example of a calendar. I don't know if that's helpful for you, um, but that's what I use if you want to, you know, solidify some process with your applications and if you want to be firm on those deadlines. But that's something for the board. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I saw that and that was helpful and it can be just carried forward. All right. Uh, I could read all the formulas. Okay, good. All right, board. Have a good evening. And we'll you want to set a time. Yes. Next. Our next date with uh, Ken. Well, bump it, uh, bump it a month. Um, that bring it on the 15th. 15th. Can no. you can hear more about the megawatt? We'll we also be at the, but the megawatt storage one. Yeah, he'll be up late again <laughs> that night. That shouldn't be too long. No, hopefully it's a, as you that's said. Enough, that's enough to run 33, 3,400, uh, 5,000 megawatt. 5,000 BTU. BTU, excuse me, yeah. 5,000 BTU air conditioners at any moment. You could cook a lot of hot dogs. That's a lot of energy. And do we want to set a task? Uh, we've been sort of chugging through our list of things. I think revamping, how far did we get on revamping special permits? Did you give us some samples on that? No, so I can do that. Okay. When you, when you talk about revamping special permits, what are you looking, are you looking to, to adopt one section? Uh, probably. Right now, we have one paragraph in the section uh, about the Zoning Board of Appeals okay. that summarizes special permit granting authority. And we do not have a free, and, that, and, and we're using that to support what the Planning Board is doing with special okay. permits. Okay. Um, and uh, right now, it's it's not really spelled out all that well. It hasn't been an issue, but um, I think we we're not looking to, you know, not looking for a, a book, but maybe just a, a one one page or two page language for um, that will apply to both planning board and uh, ZBA. Okay. And and conform with uh, what is it, section six? Yep. I do like how you earlier Bill um, um, referenced section three of the zoning act. Mm -hmm. I always like when we get to you know talk about the state act and in zoning. Yeah. Anyway, that's just the and there's always something new in there. Oh, yeah. All right, board. We'll see you on the 15th. Very good. 
Thank you. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the without dragging this out any more than it. Glad we started. <laughs> glad we started a half hour early. <laughs> this feels like old times. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, I will try to uh, put some language together by the end of the week for the um, uh, the, the local uh, technical assistance. Oh yeah. Um, for a housing development plan, I also sent around something about a program uh, grant grant opportunities for. Um, affordable housing trusts. Um, I think that we'll probably be further along if we get the housing production plan out of the way. So maybe not bothered applying to that one. And it seems that I had flagged a couple of other things. Let me just take a quick look at my, some of the stuff I've been shooting out. Um, uh, let's see, very small district took the attorney general. Uh, the attorney general did approve the, um, uh, the zoning article from the fall town meeting. Oh. Um, Was that the one about the um, housing contribution? Uh, no, that was Article 13. I don't remember what that was now. Um, zoning by. Post 21, fall. Um, oh, that was the amendment of the uh, TDR to. Um, oh, to include in the uh, all, all business zones and industrial zones. Yes. With all lots in business and industrial zones with frontage on the public way. Yeah. Because before it had specified only on certain streets, right. and we have those zones and more than those streets. Right. Yeah, we had new streets created in there. Yeah. Um, okay, so I will. Uh, uh, I'll it, it, maybe just want to. I'll uh, just pass some stuff back and forth with Jim. So we don't trigger a quorum uh, on the the grant. We had voted to apply for the grant at a prior meeting, and uh, we'll uh, we'll put something in. Hope we get it. Well, what's a grant? That's a fifty dollar bill. Uh, you know, my I, I I mess up my grants and my Abe's all the time. <laughs> Mike must know. And, and my Texas 10s. <laughs> Mike probably has a stack of those under his uh, mason jars under I'm the just, tobacco shed. I'm yeah. dating myself, but uh, Phil McCreskey was on a school match wits once. And the question was, who was on all the... I remember that. Bill, do you remember that? And he got them yes. all right. My yeah. father said, leave it to the, one of the McCreskeys to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my father you remember that? Anything. That was funny. <laughs> he says, "Yep, <laughs> yeah, yeah." That's a long time ago. No kidding. I have anything else, Mister Dwyer? I have nothing else. I have nothing else. Anybody have anything? No. Nope. Oh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Good motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Meeting is history. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank both Tommy's already signed up. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>